Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I would like to call this meeting of the Bloomington City Council to order. Thanks for joining us this evening. <coughs> We're going to start this evening with the presentation of the colors. If you would please stand and join me in the presentation. Thank you very much to the Bloomington Color Guard for presenting our colors this evening. It is uh, National Police Week. We actually started the day with a very nice uh, service out in the parking lot, uh, a salute to National Police Week, including the playing of taps and um, a rifle volley and uh, some very nice comments by Chief Booker T. Hodges. I don't see him over there, but uh, did a very nice job as well. So uh, we have... On agenda this evening that includes the following, we've got a couple of introductory items, a couple of proclamations, and then uh, our consent business with Councilmember Carter presenting our consent business. We have uh, nine things under hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. Count them, nine. The first is a public comment regarding the South Loop Alternative Urban Area Area-wide Review, and then we have eight public hearings ranging from a, uh, a pool variance to uh, a number of re renewals for our on-sale and off-sale intoxicating liquor licenses. We then move into our organization of business, and we've got, uh, we'll have a lengthy discussion of our 2023 budget update that uh, actually we moved to this Monday night from, I think it was last Monday night, whenever we, we decided to move it to a, uh, a better night to have this discussion, and then our council policy and issues update. Council, is there anything to add to the, uh, the agenda this evening? If not, I would move our agenda for tonight. Second. And a motion and a second by Council Member Lohman to accept tonight's agenda. Hearing no further council discussion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. We have an agenda, and under our agenda, item two is our introductory items, and we have two proclamations, and I am going to head down to the podium for our two proclamations. Our first proclamation tonight is for Public Works Week, and I see we have a number of folks here in our audience. Why don't we all come on up and uh, stand in behind me here as I read the proclamation, including Willie Water. So you got to get in the shot. You got to make the shot look good. Very good. <clears throat> so it is Public Works Week this week, and this is a proclamation for Public Works Week, May 15th through the 21st, 2022. Whereas public works services provided in our community are an integral part of our residents' everyday lives. And whereas the support of an understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of public works systems and programs such as water, sewers, streets and highways, park maintenance, public buildings, solid waste collection, and snow removal. And whereas the health, safety, and comfort of this community greatly depends on these facilities and services. 
And whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities, as well as their planning, design, and construction, is vitally dependent upon the efforts and skill of people uh, in public works officials. And whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated, dedicated personnel who staff public works departments is materially influenced by the people's attitude and understanding of the importance of the work they perform. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Tim Busse, do hereby proclaim the week of May 15th through the 21st, 2022, as Public Works Week in the City of Bloomington, and I call upon all residents and civic organizations to acquaint themselves with the issues involved in providing our public works and to recognize the contributions which public works officials make every day to our health, safety, comfort, and quality of life. Signed this day, the 16th of May, 2022. We have with us uh, from our public works staff, Ellen Bialis, Emma Struss, Laura Horner, and Amaris Wigehu. Did I pronounce that correctly? I hope I did. Very good. And of course, Willie Water. So uh, very happy to make this presentation and welcome you folks. Who wants to step up and say something about public works? Please, Ellen, come on. Well, I'll just say a few quick words. We're pleased to be there tonight, and thank you for the nice uh, proclamation. Um, Public Works Week is a, a great time for us to celebrate the hard work that everybody in our department does, and so we're pleased. We were happy to have Willie join us tonight since he wasn't able to make it here for Water Week, um, so he thought he would come out and celebrate with us for Public Works Week, and we plan to do a little bit of celebrating this week and hope sure. that uh, all residents uh, thank our staff for all of their good work. Very good. And can't thank you enough for the great work that you do. And um, uh, as, as I read, the services you provide, which the only time we really hear about these services is when they aren't done, whether the snow isn't plowed or the water is not working. And thankfully here in Bloomington, that happens so very rarely. So congratulations. Thank, thank you. you very much. Congratulations on Public Works Week. Thank you, thank you also very much for your work. Greatly appreciate it. Good job, Willie. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Thanks Thank for being here tonight. You. Thanks. Thank you. And our second proclamation is for Northwestern Health Sciences University Day. And President Deb Bushway is here, President and CEO of the of uh, Northwestern Health Sciences. Welcome. Thanks for being Thanks. here tonight. Thanks good to see you again. Good to Very good to see you. Well. you. Hasn't been, been far too long. It has. Congratulations. I'm going to read the proclamation and turn the microphone over to you if I could. All right. Perfect. Proclamation for Northwestern Health Sciences University Day, May 19th, 2022. Whereas in 1941, John B. Wolf Sr., D.C., incorporated a new chiropractic college with three students <laughs> forming Northwestern College of Chiropractic in downtown Minneapolis. And whereas in 1983, Northwestern moved to the current campus at 2501 West 84th Street in Bloomington, which was formerly home to Penn Junior High School. And whereas in 1999, additional modalities were introduced and the institution became Northwestern Health Sciences University. And whereas Northwestern Health Sciences University has grown significantly, now with 8,500 graduates in 11 countries, 1,110 current students and 130 faculty members, full and part-time, across 11 program areas. And whereas, Northwestern Health Sciences University serves the Bloomington community through education and clinical care. And whereas, in 2021, Northwestern Health Sciences University celebrated their 80-year anniversary, a public celebration which was delayed a year due to the pandemic, will be held on May 19th from 4 to 7 p.m. And whereas Northwestern Health Sciences University is forward-focused and committed to building a brighter, more equitable future through in integrative health care, a future only possible because of the strong history of leadership and innovation. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Tim Bussey, do hereby proclaim May 19th, 2022, as Northwestern Health Sciences University Day in the city of Bloomington and call upon the people of Bloomington to observe this day by recognizing individuals affiliated with the university in the past and in the present, including founders, students, staff, faculty, alumni, providers, patients, donors, business partners, and community members who continue to set an example to the residents, visitors, and businesses of our city as a premier health sciences university dedicated to creating a healthier world, dated this day, the 16th day of May, 2022. 
Congratulations. I'm sorry it's a year late. We couldn't do this last year. I, it's we disappointing. Didn't have it last year, we didn't right? have it. I, I'm, I'm very happy for you. Thank Please, you. I'd like to turn over the microphone no, you, to you here. Please. I think you really said it all. Thank you. We really appreciate the support in Bloomington. We've had a great partnership with the city. We're very appreciative of the long relationship we've had. It's been wonderful for us. We get tremendous support from the city for all those invisible services you talked about as well as other things and so we love our location uh, we I guess I would remind you we do have a clinic that serves people um, the public we have a couple of different clinics but the one on campus is open to anyone um, and we do we do take on a number of new kinds of academic programs everything from medical assisting to radiation uh, therapy so we have a range of allied health programs as well but the key thing here is, if you are free Thursday afternoon, drop by. I think many, some of you might have even gone to the building when you, it was a junior high. And uh, so stop in and say hi. But thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Bushman. Thanks for, the, Bush thanks for yeah. the, the, being such a great community member. You've hosted our, our Veterans Day we love breakfast that. in the past. You, I you hope we can a, do that again I this year. I hope we absolutely yeah. can do that again yeah. this year. You've been awesome. such a fantastic community member. I like to offer you this proclamation. Thank Say you. Congratulations and hope to see you on it. Thursday. Yeah, Thank yeah. you so very I hope much. to see you as well. Thanks. Next up on our agenda is item three, our consent business. Councilmember Carter has tonight's consent agenda. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. So uh, as of now, I have holds from Councilmember D'Alessandro for item 3.4, and then Councilmember Coulter for 3.9. So I'll do one last call. Any other holds? Hearing none, seeing none. I will move to approve items 3.1 to 3.3, items 3.5 to 3.8, and then item 3.10. Second. Motion by Councilmember Carter, second by Councilmember Lohman to accept tonight's consent to business as stated. Hearing no further council discussion on this, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Item 3.4, uh, Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I was just really excited to hear a little bit more about this project. Um, it, um, I, I'm assuming it's another one of these great innovations from city staff about how to go find uh, support and, and work with community members to uh, to help us understand a little bit more. It's got two co really interesting components, I thought, both um, of interest potentially to kind of the community members. One, the, the alternative transportation opportunity to, to, to review that for um, for 35W and then uh, and then the Penn Lake stuff. So I don't know if, if anyone's here who can speak a little bit more to it, but I'd love to know what the um, what the um, I guess the relationship is with the engineering team. And then um, you know, is this like an internship or is it more of a project or you know, are they paid? Like, how does it work? That'd be great. Thanks. Julie Long is here to answer all those questions. All right. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember D'Alessandro. This is our first foray into partnering with the University of St. Thomas. Um, they have a fairly new civil engineering program. They've graduated their first class of civil engineers this year. Um, and we have hired interns from them in the past. Um, they are looking for real life example projects that the students could take on for two semesters either the summer, fall, or fall, spring semester. And this project is proposed for their summer, fall class, and it's why we combined two um, project areas together. One is the alternative transportation, looking at a bike facility that would connect two of our new facilities, the uh, bridge over the Minnesota River and the Orange Line Tunnel. So in our alternative transportation plan, there is a, an alignment that got put in there, but who knows if that's the best alignment. So we want the students to look at alternatives to see if this is the best corridor. Should it be three blocks east, west? We don't know. Um, but because of the student size and the number of projects that St. Thomas doesn't currently have, they're like, we think we need a project for five students instead of three students. So can you expand the scope? Um, as council is aware, um, the Penn Lake um, area has uh, some 
TMDLs, total maximum daily load requirements. I'm gonna throw a whole bunch of acronyms at you. I apologize in advance about that. Um, ba basically, we have a waste load allocation that says we can only have 110 pounds, and don't quote me on that number, of pollutants in this area. So we need to look at how we can maximize improving our stormwater quality in that area. And because you're all familiar with the area, it's fairly well built out, 35 Ws to the east of it, you know, how are we gonna do that? So we were thinking the students could brainstorm different ideas and include that in the project. Really cool. Um, do you anticipate that they'll do a presentation uh, for your, you know, for your department or even for us on the outcome of their work? Um, they have to prepare a report for school and they have to do a presentation. Whether or not they do a presentation for you is still um, to be determined. Okay. Um, yeah. I would love to see any results. I think it would I be think awesome. It would be a good thing if they did a presentation yeah. to us. At, uh, see if we if they're up make for that it. happen. All right. I think that would be great. Thank you for your time. Yes. Appreciate Thank you. Any further questions, Councilmember? Councilmember D'Alessandro, do you want to move this one then, please? I would. Let's, uh, let's authorize the mayor and city manager to uh, enter into an agreement with the University of St. Thomas for a civil engineering project as part of their engineering senior design clinic class. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Martin to accept item 3.4 in the consent business. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Motion carries 7-0. Item 3.9, Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor, and I am going to apologize in advance for the coughing and hacking that is taking place tonight. I don't have COVID, I promise you that. Um, I just have a, a nasty, nagging cough. Um, I held this item partly because I know there's been some public interest in this. Um, this item just acknowledges that the City Council has received uh, recommendations from our Charter Commission related to uh, various amendments that are coming forward and and tonight obviously is not the public hearing this is not where we will make the decisions on these um, but I just wanted to sort of bring that to to folks attention because I know there's always lots of interest when we talk about charter amendments um, in particular I wanted to point out I know there's been some discussion um, about one potential proposal related to how the City Council discusses setting its own salary um, and I did just want to point out that that particular recommendation or there was no I guess I should say there was no recommendation related to that um, that nothing is moving forward as far as a charter amendment uh, related to how excuse me how the City Council set its salary um, but that's also part of the reason that I wanted to bring this up because I'm, I'm disappointed that there is no recommendation regarding how the council sets its salary moving forward and I'm, I'm not referring to the Specific proposal was that was discussed. I think I think it makes sense not to move forward with that Right now in our city charter our salary as council members is Stated specifically that it is a, a product of ordinance that the city council essentially sets its own salary and when we Take a vote on things that affect us personally financially We are expected and in fact as our city attorney would likely say required by law to abstain because it's a conflict of interest. The one exception is our own salary as city council members. And I, I understand legally it, it, it may not be a conflict of interest, but I think to most folks out there who understand, who hear that, it sure feels like one. It, it just, it, to me, it just does not seem like good policy for a number of reasons that the city council sets its own salary. And I have raised this issue with other council members. I have raised this issue with staff. Um, I, I think it is something that we should change within our charter. I, you know, I've worked through various, various, um, ideas as to how to do that. And, and, uh, <laughs> perhaps unsurprisingly, they have not been workable. Um, <laughs> but I, I just want to urge us to continue thinking about this because it, it, there are, like I said, there are just a number of reasons why I think it is not good policy that elected officials, frankly, set their own salary. Um, and it, it is disappointing to me that nothing is moving forward yet, and I will certainly accept, you know, the blame on that. But I just wanted to, to air that issue publicly because I think it is something, even if it's not something that, that folks think about on an everyday basis, I think it is important to how our legitimacy as a city council is, is received by the community. Um, so with that, I will move to acknowledge receipt of resolutions 2022-1C, 
2022 2C and 2022 3C from the Charter Commission and to set public hearings on June 13th, 2022 for each recommendation from the Charter Commission. Second. Motion by Councilmember Coulter, second by Councilmember Lohman to accept item 3.9 on the consent business. No further council discussion on this? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> Motion carries 7-0. Thank you, Councilmember Carter. Moving on to item four on our agenda is our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. And our first uh, item on this agenda uh, portion is item 4.1, which is a public comment opportunity on our Self Loop Alternative Urban Area Wide Review. Its uh, acronym is AUAR, <coughs> and we get an update and report and the mitigation plan. Uh, Julie Farnham, our senior planner, is here to present this for us and to lead us through this. Good evening, Ms. Farnham. Welcome. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. I've got a brief presentation which I will bring up right now. Are you able to see that? We are able to see your uh, your screen. Uh, you're now in. You also have the next slide screen up. So okay. I think I think if you go up to display settings, isn't this silly that I know how to do this now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and swap presenter view. There you go. Uh, no. Uh, no. I think it's the other one. Okay. Let me try that again. There we go. Is it working now? Whatever you did, you fixed it. Well done. Okay, well, here we go. Okay, I am here to um, give the presentation to hopefully approve the um, South Loop Alternative Urban Area Wide Review Update. <clears throat> so uh, this is a substitute for individual EAWs or EISs that would occur in the study area, which is essentially the South Loop District and it assesses the cumulative environmental impacts of development in this district. And it must be updated every five years to remain in effect. So what it is not, there's always confusion around uh, environmental review um, and it does not initiate any specific development projects. It identifies anticipated future development, and that's what is called the development scenario, or that's the alternative, if you will, that is being reviewed uh, in this environmental review process. It also does not approve or deny any specific development project. Any project that's you know, listed in here, I mean, quite frankly, these are forecasts. The development scenario in the AUER reflects projects that we know because they've been approved and they are actually built and those that we anticipate, some of which have had preliminary plan developments approved and we have a pretty good sense and others that we uh, base on uh, forecasts and just our knowledge from talking to property owners and our developers of what we anticipate to happen in the area. So once a project actually materialized, it'll have to go come through uh, our regular review process and be reviewed by the Planning Commission and the City Council. So the initial uh, South Loop AUAR was uh, adopted in 2002, and we had some very minor interim updates in 2009 and, and 2012 that basically uh, incorporated some infrastructure projects that had not been anticipated before. In 2017, we did a very comprehensive update and updated the forecast and the whole development scenario, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a second. And this current update is really just a, a minor revision to that more comprehensive 2017 update. So I wanted to put this in here to show you how things have changed since 2002. So on the left, you see the development scenario that was in the original AUAR, and it had a five-year development outlook. Again, the AUAR gets updated every five years, so they would add, the, I think the idea was that they would add new sites as they become more known. In the 2017 update, we decided, we were also working on the comp plan at the same time, and the uh, 
South Loop District Plan had been completed, et cetera. And so we had a pretty good sense of what full build might actually be here in the South Loop. So we expanded the development scenario to include all the sites that we anticipate will redevelop over the next 20 to 25 years. So that's what you're seeing in, in the uh, 2022 uh, development scenario, which is essentially the same as 2017. There's just some minor tweaks to the gateway site and the apple tree site. So this is the uh, review process. This is uh, laid out by the state. Um, it's very formal review process. And on an update, um, there's a 10 day review period. Uh, well, I'll just step back for a second back uh, in early or late February, actually, I was before the council and you released it, the AUAR, the draft had been prepared, you released it to uh, initiate the formal review process. So, so that happened back in February. Uh, then we go through this, we post it, uh, the, the Environmental Quality Board, EQB, posts it. And that starts the uh, review, the official review period for an update. It's 10 days. Um, the EQB also maintains the list of who reviews this in terms of who you have to send uh, notice to. And they're primarily state agencies and, and regional agencies. So we send it up to all of those folks. We also uh, have it uh, at the library and well, I'll get into this a little bit more, I guess. I've got another slide to, that gets into this. But anyway, it goes through the, the initial review period where, you know, if there are any comments, then we have to respond to the comments and return it back to um, the official review list. And we did that. And so there's another 10 days for them to make any objections. And we did not get any objections. So the next step then is to um, act on it tonight uh, and if you approve it, it'll then be submitted to the EQB and that'll be it for the next five years, unless there's a trigger and I'll get into that later. So here is the outreach engagement that uh, is required and what also that we did in addition. So as I mentioned, the EQB keeps the official distribution list. We sent it to all of them. We put a notice in the newspaper. We made copies available at the libraries and at City Hall. We went over and above that and we uh, hosted a, it was virtual this time around, a public informational meeting. We sent direct notices to uh, people in the northern half of of the South Loop District, the area that is really most impacted because all of the development sites are in the northern area of the South Loop District. Uh, we have the information on the website and we also had a Let's Talk Bloomington page created. So uh, we got a few comments during that uh, agency review period. Um, no objections were filed, as I mentioned. Most of the comments were kind of technical details and really urging the city to go further in some cases, which was I thought was good news. For instance, Hennepin County was and uh, MnDOT were both interested in um, the city going further in terms of uh, developing a bike uh, network in the South Loop District and also um, providing uh, maybe a bigger buffer to the, the bluff. So those are things that, you know, as we start working on the South Loop District Plan update next year, and also just individual projects, you know, if there's any roadway projects, you know, um, Hennepin County and, and MnDOT basically said, you know, we want to partner with you. So I saw that as good news. So we can uh, hold them to that when we start uh, actually getting into uh, plans and, and actual projects. So next step, as I said, um, assuming this is approved tonight, uh, I will submit it to the EQB and that pretty much uh, makes it good to go for the next five years um, unless something happens that would trigger an update. And so the trigger criteria here are if development is proposed that exceeds the AUAR scenario that was analyzed, if there's any a major change in public infrastructure, which would put with potentially negative impacts in the area, again, that was not analyzed, or if the timing of public facilities changed in a way that would uh, 
lead to increased or negative impacts. Um, or if there's some kind of a significant change in the assumptions <clears throat> or an underestimation of the impacts. So those are the, the criteria that would trigger an interim update. And so with that, um, I have in front of you a motion, should you care to uh, use it, there is a, a resolution. Uh, the, the process is that the council would approve this by resolution. And so that would be the actual motion. And I'm also here to answer any questions before you take any action. So I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Ms. Farner, for the presentation. Uh, very informative as always. Uh, one question, if just by chance there happened to be a, I don't know, let's say a World Expo in that area, would that be uh, a trigger to change the AUAR? It could be. So what would have to happen? So um, the development scenario, as I understand, uh, the potential expo would uh, primarily occur on on the adjoining lands or, or MOA site, uh, phase three site. So the AUAR does list that as a redevelopment site and it has um, it projects a certain amount, a fairly large amount of development on there. Now, it may not be as large as what uh, Expo would would generate. Um, likewise, an Expo might generate some infrastructure improvements that perhaps are slated or, or were identified in the AUAR, but not to occur for later until you know the, the area gets more to full development. And so that would be that trigger that is if you know uh, infrastructure happens in a time at a time that's much different than the, what was analyzed. So what has to happen here is should uh, Bloomington's bid be accepted, um, the next step would be. Uh, coming up with a plan, essentially a concept plan, at least for the expo so that you could quantify how much development, what type of development, um, what kind of traffic or utility needs are to support that um, development, that, that uh, the expo. And then you would compare it to what was analyzed in the development scenario in the 2022 AUAR, and if it exceeds what was uh, presented in that in the AUAR, then that would trigger it. My guess is, it, and it, it gets a little bit um, unclear. You know, who who gets to decide how much? You know, if it really is bigger, you know, and if it gets close or or whatever, you know, it's, really it's the discretion is on the city. The RGU to make that determination, um, but I think it would be best to err on the side of caution and do an update. Uh, you know, if if the expo would result in development that was as much or even just a little bit bigger than what the AUAR uh, looked at, um, I, I think it would be. I mean, that would be my suggestion. The update can be narrowly focused. So the update can doesn't have to be a wholesale update like we did this year and like we did in 2017. It could be primarily just to make changes that are needed to incorporate whatever um, development changes or infrastructure changes are specific to expo so does that answer your question yes it does thank you thank you <clears throat> council additional questions council member martin uh, thank you, Mayor. I guess not so much a question, but I just want to uh, to give a quick kudos. Thank you uh, and your team so much for doing that optional information session over there. I know I get all kinds of questions about what's coming up in the neighborhood, uh, tons of development and possibility, and I just think that's awesome that we've got nine more folks over there that can share that reliable information with their neighbors. Uh, so thank you for taking the time to do that. Sure, you're welcome. Council, any questions? Council Member D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mayor. Oh. Can, would you mind going back to the slide uh, that had the triggers on it? I just had a question for you about 
those. Yeah, thank you. So um, I know um, the mayor asked probably what I would have asked about the first one, which is whether or not there's a, a scenario that exceeds the, the authority here. I, I, I'm curious about the um, change in public infrastructure. Um, do I don't know if that if, if this falls into that or not, but I know um, we've talked about the um, the uh, uh, Riverview rail line proposal that is also in the works. It feels like that may may or may not trigger something here. I was curious about whether or not that was considered or since we know about it in advance. Um, and then um, um, whether or not there's a, an assumption here. I, I didn't see a whole lot in here about um, the water park and specifically water utilization. And it seems like that would have been something that we might need to make major adjustments about. So I, those would be the two things that Either we're, are we waiting for them to trigger this, um, or should we be paying attention to them now, given that we know that they probably will? Thank you. Ms. Farnham? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilmember Gelisandro. Um, so with the, the water park, so the AUAR does incorporate our most current utility uh, models and uh infrastructure models that, that we have. And so since the water park was essentially already approved or um, and has been in the works for quite some time, that is already incorporated into the, um, the uh, assumptions, the development assumptions that are in the AUAR. Um, so yeah, any of the development that we are aware of. So the Mall of America, you know, we've got our, we've got even a phase three plan. In fact, the the proposed development on the adjoining lands uh, matches what was approved, I think in 2015 or was it 2017 that the mall came in and with their last preliminary plan development that included, um, that site and and the most current development on that site at any rate um the all of the infrastructure water sewer roads are all up as up to date as we know right now and so any project that has gone through preliminary or final development uh process or even things that we have knowledge of pretty good knowledge of because we're in conversation with the property owner or a developer that was all included in our development assumptions so that the development scenario assumes a certain amount of development and so the water park has been part of the mall's plan development for a number of years now so that that's all uh, incorporated in here that's covered um, to your point about the <clears throat> potential um, realignment of the light rail, I think that's a that's a good example of a project that I think would trigger uh, an update, and that update could focus strictly on on that. Um, as an example, I will say that I think it was the 2009 or maybe it was the 2012 update. The, the sole project that triggered that update, that was the 2012 update, the sole project that triggered that was the lowering of Lindau. Because when we updated in 20, 2009, we hadn't anticipated that. And then all of a sudden that became um, a project that had some legs. And, and so we had to do an update for that single uh, infrastructure project. And so that update was very narrowly focused on that infrastructure. Likewise, with um, Riverview Corridor, if that changes the alignment of the blue line, um, <clears throat> it could be a similar kind of thing. Now, that might happen in conjunction with uh, an expo kind of a thing, for instance. So there might be multiple things that, that would be happening at the same time that would, would trigger. So um, I hope that answers your question. It, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Mr. Mayor, I would just ask, maybe we could um, take offline. I'd, I'd love to see the specifics about that because um, 
that would the implication of of what I heard was that most likely the water impact information was in the 2017 update. Then, if that had been around for a while, I'd love to just see the specifics. So maybe somebody can staff can point me to where I could see the difference between 2012 and 2015. That is including those those impact analyses. That'd be great. Will do. Thank you. Thank you. Council, any additional questions? If not, this is an opportunity for public comment on the South Loop Alternative Urban uh, Area Review. Um, is anyone in the council chamber wishing to speak to item 4.1 this evening? Anyone? Nora, do we have anyone online who wishes to speak to item 4.1 tonight? As of the moment, there are no participants uh, via phone line. So, Mr. Mayor, you may proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Last call for anybody here in the chambers. See no one coming forward. We've got nobody on line, so I will close the public comment portion of item 4.1. And ask council if you have any additional questions or clarifications that we need before we take action on this. Anything additional? Councilmember D'Alessandro? May, may, Mr. Mayor, I, I, not so much a question or clarification, just a, I didn't know if we could do a little bit of a comment period here. Oh, absolutely. That's, that's Is where, that okay? That's where this would be appropriate, yes. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so I guess um, <laughs> I, I, I want us to be, I, I saw in the documentation that we had, um, we had made at least uh, uh, an attempt at of, of acknowledging some of the, the more ecological uh, uh, considerations. I know there was some, you know, some of the analysis on the bluffs and uh, the archaeological the questions, um, uh, Ike's, Ike's Creek and the water considerations there. Um, I'm just, um, I, I, we don't have a sustainability strategic plan here as a council yet, right? We have been talking about the the idea of creating a um, uh, leveling, leveling up, if you will, um, our, uh, you know, our tracking towards uh, sustainability and climate, um, especially after declaring the emergency that we did, et cetera. I'm, I'm just not quite sure how do we have as a council the opportunity to come back and look at this between these five year five years, um, or do we bring those up on an as needed basis? Like I'm just trying to understand. How, if we decide to take action before the end of this year around climate, um, what, how do, how does that trigger this, and and should we be considering it now, or do we feel like we've got everything in there that we need to be as flexible as we can? I'm just, I'm pondering that question, and I thought I'd throw it out to the group in case there's anybody else who's maybe looked at this and have some comments on it. Thanks. I, I would defer to uh, to staff on this, but I, I would just in looking at it. Uh, as I see the triggers, I mean, the significant change in assumptions and or uh, underestimation of impacts, I think that would fall into that. If there's a change of assumptions, if we develop some sort of uh, climate or sustainability plan that will affect this in some way, I'm assuming it would trigger this as well. And it would trigger, it would open the discussion once again. Uh, am I correct at that, Ms. Farnham? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Member D'Alessandro. Um, if, if we adopted a, a climate plan, uh, that would not trigger an, an update to the AUAR. During the next update to the AUAR, you would reference that and whatever mitigation, uh, you know, if that climate plan has some mitigation measures in it, those would be incorporated into the mitigation plan, uh, but it, just adopting that plan does not trigger uh, an update to the AUAR. Neither would updating the South Loop District Plan trigger an update to this. I mean, part of the reason why these get updated every five years is to uh, bring in all of those things that have happened. Uh, in between the the updates, the, the required updates. One of the things that's a little tricky with an AUAR compared to an EAW or an EIS is an AUAR is not project specific. So while we have square footages of development 
anticipated and we might know the type of development, you know, whether it's going to be hotel or office. Or, I mean, these are also forecasts, right? Or, or they're based on preliminary development plans that have been approved or entitled. <clears throat> but those can change once it gets to the final development plan. So it's not specific. And so we don't have, which was one of the challenges in the, those two new sections that I incorporated here, which... Um, we're not required. Um, I made the, I guess, executive decision to include those because come next year, the state is going to require those two new sections for EAWs and EISs. The guidance for AUARs is yet to be determined. Um, and it's a challenge to measure, for instance, greenhouse gas uh, emissions when you don't have specific project plan you there's maybe a way that you can do it based on gross square footages and land use type um but it's not nearly as accurate as if you know that you know once you get to an actual development proposal you have specifics and then you can you can measure things much more, much more accurately. So that's one of the, one of the kind of the downfalls of an AUAR is that um, you are assessing impacts based on a, a kind of a thirty thousand up level view of of things, and not at the at the specific development uh, level. And that's why these triggers. So if a development proposal comes in that's significantly different from what was anticipated, that triggers an update. I think I understand. My only comment there being that we we would we would not necessarily want to let this stand and and as a result preempt any specific concern we might have as it relates to any changes we make in terms of our prioritization around climate or anything like that. It sounds like we have that flexibility on a on a development by development basis. Is that fair? I, I... Yes, Mr. Mayor and uh, Council Member D'Alessandro. Yes, so if we adopt a climate plan and there are some requirements, just like if we adopted a new zoning ordinance or you know uh, some requirement for electric charging vehicle infrastructure or something like that, um, a development that comes through the door after those requirements have been adopted is going to have to meet those. Um, so the AUAR isn't going to affect that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ray. I, I don't recall the AUAR getting in the way of developments in, in the past. Just uh, I, I think, as Ms. Farnham said, it just it has more to do with it, it's the guide and it has more to do with the specifics that we set in in ordinance or requirements that we have. Sure. I, I as it is my first time reviewing one of these, I wasn't sure if it was in some way replacing um, or it could be used as a as a way, for lack of a better way to put it, around like a specific environmental review or something to that effect. Oh. Since, uh, but that that helps. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate it. Councilmember Loman. Yeah, thank you, Mary. I think you put it best and as succinctly as, as possible. And what I would say is. <clears throat> Now, we've, now, since we're having conversation about this, would be another opportunity to talk about putting together a sustainable development plan um, and, and really uh, kind of keying in on that. And that's, I mean, it'd probably be a step in between that climate uh, uh, piece, and then we can really uh, guide and drive forward our our, uh, our development. Um, and so, you know, as we you know, look to our priorities uh, for um, next year, and as we continue to look at stuff at the Sustainability Commission, um, I know that I will, uh, again, put that forward, and also for this council, uh, uh, so that we can uh, look at those things uh, specifically. And Mayor, if uh, there isn't anything else, I would love to go ahead and move this. Anyone else have an additional comment, question on this? I, I just will say, I think this will be a, this could be a, uh, what you just said, a great conversation at our upcoming strategic planning retreat. So, unless there's anything else, Councilmember Lohman. Mayor, I move to approve a resolution adopting the South Loop Alternative Urban Area Wide Review Update Report and Mitigation Plan as attached in this packet. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Martin. 
to approve the resolution adopting the South Loop, South Loop Alternative Urban Area-Wide Review Update Report and Mitigation Plan. No further council discussion on this? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Julie, I understand this might be the last time we see you, and I'm sorry to hear that. Retiring yes, after <laughs> after almost uh, what uh, almost close to two decades here with the city of Bloomington, is that correct? Sixteen years. Sixteen yeah. years. Yeah. Well, thank you so very much for your work. I think uh, I I heard you present at least two comp plans, I believe, to the council, and I know you worked on the district plans for uh, Penn and American and Normandale Lake and South Loop, and I know you worked quite a bit with uh, uh, the uh, Creative Placemaking Commission. So congratulations on your retirement. Thank you for your work for the city of Bloomington and shaping the way the city of Bloomington works and looks and, and is right now. So thank you, very well done. Well, thank you, it's been a pleasure. I've had uh, really, I'm grateful for the opportunity to work on so many interesting projects really over these last 16 years. And, and having uh, elected officials and, and uh, appointed uh, commission members who have been so supportive and ask good questions and um, keep us moving forward and, and into new directions. So thank you. We never lack for interesting projects around here, it seems. <laughs> so thank you. Congratulations. Enjoy it. Thanks. Thanks. Up next on our agenda is item 4.2, which is a public hearing. This is for a uh, pool variance at 7981 Lea Circle. It's a change of conditions. And uh, Mr. Johnson from our planning department is going to take us through this. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor Bussey, and uh, good to see uh, members of the city council. Um, tonight's application item 4.2 actually uh, relates to a change of conditions of approval uh, pertaining to two, two different variance cases at one property. Um, there's a, a fair amount of history that informs kind of how we got here tonight, so I'll take you through that. Um, the the Lee Woods subdivision is in the uh, northwest part of the city, uh, so this is to the west of uh, East or Bush Lake Road, East Bush Lake Road, and uh, just south of 494. Um, one thing I hope you gather from the uh, image, the aerial image here uh, before you, is that it's a heavily wooded subdivision. It's in one of the older neighborhoods. It is uh, developed uh, mostly in the 60s. Some of the homes were built in the 70s, so a little bit of scattering in the years or ages of some of the homes. Uh, around here. Um, there are six lots that are served by a private drive. You can see Lee Circle there in the middle of the, the image. Um, this was formerly two residential lots that was uh, subdivided and replatted as six residential lots in 2001. Um, it was uh, had some unique characteristics in that it was served by a private drive and you'll notice in kind of the zoning history that follows it, a lot of that informs kind of some of the actions that have taken place since then. Um, one of the other features of the subdivision is that uh, it is heavily wooded on the north side. Uh, there actually was a scenic easement on the north uh, five lots uh, that was put in place at the time of platting. The subject lot before you this evening uh, was the last home to be constructed in the subdivision uh, and did involve a single family uh, dwelling setback variance uh, to Lee Road. Um, and one thing again just to note uh, that relates to both of these variance cases is that uh, for practical purposes, the um, kind of rear portion of the, the home, if you want to call it that, the home is oriented towards the private drive. So technically, its zoning front yard is the, the rear of the dwelling. So that's what creates kind of these sticky uh, zoning issues that we, we confront with this, with this property. Um, yeah. Let's keep going here. So just to recalibrate someone, uh, everyone on the board and members of the public on kind of what the rules of the game are, so to speak, as it relates to these two different actions. Again, two conditions of approval uh, requested to be removed in two variance cases. So just for everybody's benefit, a variance is a formal waiver uh, to a zoning requirement. Uh, it typically required, uh, follows some characteristic of a lot that is unique to that specific property. Um, the, the current test on the, the state statutes and city codes is based on a practical difficulties test and required for the approval of any variance action, uh, the application must meet a number of findings. And forgive me for all the text on this slide. I promise I don't have slides, every slide full of text, uh, and that might be a little bit small, but I want to point your attention 
uh, to the um, to one of the specific findings. And just as a reminder, in order to get variance approval, you have to meet all of the required findings. It's kind of an all or nothing uh, type proposition. The one finding as it relates to tonight's discussion from staff's perspective has to do with the last finding. It has to do with uh, the variance, if granted, will not alter the essential character of the locality. So that by which becomes one of the tests uh, that staff does the analysis on this application this evening. Um, and there is some additional uh, city code language in the variance section of our city code. It's actually in chapter two under the planning commission section. But what it has to do with, it has to do with the conditions of approval that are applied to variances that they must bear a rough proportionality to the impact created by the variance. So when you're looking at any condition of approval that is connected or associated with a variance, that's kind of the test uh, or the uh, city code ordinance uh, standard that has to be met for any uh, conditions of approval that are attached to a variance. Getting to our next just calibration uh, of concepts here is the last one, but uh, there is uh, some discussion in this case about scenic easements. Um, this is the definition of a scenic easement from city code. Uh, it is held by a governmental uh, easement held by a governmental body in order to preserve the character of an existing landscape and top topography. Uh, it is a development tool that the city has utilized for a long period of time. If I had to guess, I think that there's probably somewhere between uh, 35 and 40 active scenic easements uh, in Bloomington. Uh, it is a tool that has been often been uh, utilized down on the bluff before we had the bluff protection ordinance in order to protect sensitive areas down there. Uh, but in other portions of the city having to do with subdivision uh, applications, similar to kind of this area, even leading up to just individual property uh, development applications, sometimes in, the, in uh, relation to variances as well. Uh, so the, very, the scenic easements on the books today do vary. Some of them apply to multiple properties, kind of like the one on the north side of the Leewood subdivision. There's five lots that that one applies to. And then you have the case of, in this instance, where the, this act of scenic easement only applies to one property. And again, it followed as a condition of approval to a variance. Um, what are they used for? Mainly they're used for those three uh, kind of concepts. One is tree protection, certainly want to preserve mature and significant trees. Uh, soil stabilization and kind of uh, keeping steep slopes, slopes intact, that's an important one for the engineering division in terms of preventing landslide and other erosion type uh, um, um, actions. And then uh, just general character uh, or preservation of the existing character. If you find a heavily wooded area uh, such as this one, you get a development application, you might have seen in the past the city uh, require a scenic easement in order to try and best maintain uh, the character that was there previously or existing. So the first variance action for this property, again, I mentioned that it was the last uh, single family uh, dwelling built in this uh, six lot subdivision. It was the only uh, lot that faced its uh, technical frontage was Lee Road, the others uh, fronted on Forest Glen. Um, and the original variance that was approved for this property was in 2003. It was to reduce the prevailing front setback from 65 uh, to 50 feet. So you can see that 50 foot marker on that uh, slide. Um, that, that's by which the, the porch you can see on the north side of the home uh, butted up to that 50 foot setback. So prevailing front setback, something that is on the books for uh, older uh, residential lots in Bloomington. In this case, they reduced that to 50 feet in order to uh, provide a, a building pad for the home. Um, associated with this case, uh, there was two conditions of approval attached to that variance that are relevant uh, to this instance. Um, I'll pull those up on the screen again, more uh, text, but the first condition, condition three, had to do with requiring a 30-foot scenic easement. So that was something that was established in uh, 2003. And the fourth condition had to do with uh, requiring a variety of spruce and uh, pine trees um, in order to help screen and buffer the property. And what you'll find oftentimes in applications like this, particularly uh, for some of the neighboring residents or property owners, they want to see some of that screening kind of just mitigating what the impact of the, the reduced setback was. A note about the scenic easement in this case is that unfortunately it was failed to be recorded. So it was uh, not recorded against the property. Um, uh, in error. So um, moving on there, but so th this application seeks to remove these older conditions of approval. These conditions were effectively replaced by last year's variance case in practicality, but in order to clear the books or make it a clean slate type of thing, the applicant would uh, seek to remove these conditions as well. So moving forward to last year's case, um, the resident first came in contact with planning staff 
uh, to investigate some of the trees on their lot. They uh, became aware of the scenic easement and some of the restrictions therein about um, restrictions on tree removal. Um, so to their credit, they did uh, work with or uh, consult with the city, the city forester on uh, the removal of some trees located within the easement. And the reason for that was is that some of the trees that were planted uh, following that 2003 action were in poor health, uh, were not doing well. And so he did consult with the city forester before removing some of those trees. Um, what followed that in this, what led to a variance application that was reviewed and processed last year had to do with the uh, desire to construct a swimming pool. And getting back to that concept about uh, Lee Road really being technically the zoning front yard of this property, swimming pools are not allowed to be in the front yard of a property according to our zoning code. So that's what informed um, that action uh, and was approved by the city council on the consent agenda, I think in April of, uh, or I might have the month slightly off, but in last year. <laughs> Uh, this project has since been uh, completed. What you see before you, uh, again, kind of building off that original history of the property, staff uh, carried that same concept uh, of dealing, uh, of trying to maintain the essential character of the neighborhood. Those two prior uh, conditions of approval having to do with scenic easement and landscaping, staff carried that forward to this action in order to mitigate the further uh, additional development, if you will, uh, and what you see before you here is kind of what resulted. It's a, a revised scenic easement that's 22 feet in width, um, kind of butting up to the, um, the uh, decking of the pool, and then two rows of plantings. And two rows uh, of plantings were recommended by staff. And the purpose being, if you look in our uh, screening section, this is pretty consistent. When you're utilizing plantings and trees as a, a way to screen and buffer, uh, the two rows is much more effective than one. Uh, one, simply because it fills in the gaps that the, the first row of plantings do not, and it adds depth uh, to the screen and buffer. And in this case, there's a little bit of elevation as well. Uh, the eastern row of the trees would be a little bit higher. So again, just uh, providing a, a larger uh, screen and buffer there. Um, I'll talk about that in the next slide. This is the uh, two conditions of approval that related to last year's case uh, that I mentioned. Again, this application seeks to remove these conditions of approval. So just in summary, to make it clear what is being asked for, it's removing of the scenic easement and landscaping conditions associated with both cases. Hopefully that is uh, clear. Um, this is the project that resulted. It was constructed uh, last year. Um, in terms of kind of the, uh, some of the things that we're talking about are just some to kind of set uh, where we're at here. I don't, you probably can't see my cursor very well. But this area up on the high side of the retaining wall that's currently a grass area, that's where, in effect, if you were looking at the previous slide of the landscape plan, that's where that second row of plantings uh, would be located, uh, if that helps uh, set kind of uh, set some context there. So there's the project uh, completed. You can see some of the plantings that were installed by the property owner on the low side of the wall, and we'll talk about those a little bit. The applicant actually provided a revised landscape plan of the material that he installed uh, last fall. And so it's a mix of maple trees and spruce. To his credit, he did install larger uh, maple trees than just the, the typical minimum uh, um, planting size. So I think these are five inch caliber maple trees. You can see they are a little bit larger. And in the summer months when they have leaf on conditions, uh, certainly do uh, provide some screening and buffering. Um, one other point I wanted to make on this slide is that, uh, as you know, along the front yard of all of our, uh, most of our properties in Bloomington Residential, we do have a 10-foot easement area that includes drainage and utility easements as well as sidewalk bikeway easements. We use those easements for a number of different uh, types of infrastructure and other uh, improvement projects. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Here is just some comparative photos that were in the staff report. This just kind of gives you an idea of what the prior condition was. So you can see on the 2013 slide, and some of these images are provided by the applicants, some from Google Street View. Um, but you can see when uh, the previous uh, evergreen trees uh, were mature and they, 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 they grew up, obviously it provided a, a fairly good screen. And again, just getting back to kind of that uh, maintaining of the essential character idea as well. This is kind of facing the more uh, southern direction in the same uh, eastern way, but from the other side of the property. Now, this is more stark contrast because obviously the street view in this case was taken in a winter condition. Um, but uh, just to note that, um, you know, when having another, uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, yeah, 
I don't mean it for it to be so stark as the winter leaf off conditions, but I just wanted to provide at least that uh, perspective from that direction. So staff did, uh, did perform some analysis of this application. Uh, in terms of uh, kind of how we evaluated it, we're not supportive of the application for two primary reasons. Uh, first of all, the test by which there's not formal findings in a change of condition application, but the formal findings by which uh, we're kind of evaluating it, again, dates back to that, uh, the required findings for a variance. In this case, the one that is the most relevant from staff's perspective has to do with the uh, the project will not impact the essential character of the locality. And so clearly there is a uh, well-established history, uh, A, with the adoptions of the conditions of approval in 03, which were uh, committed to the neighborhood at that point, but then again, just carrying those same uh, conditions of approval forward in uh, last year's action. All of those actions are intended to maintain the essential character of the locality. So screening and buffering uh, certainly provides, tries to help maintain that wooded road edge uh, that you see is so common for that residential neighborhood um, uh, and the like. The other thing, the second reason that uh, staff, I mentioned uh, the presence of the drainage and utility easement and the sidewalk bikeway easement. Now that uh, particular right of way, because Lee Road is a narrower road, it was constructed in the woods with trying to minimize disruption. Um, that's a 24 foot wide road, I believe. Um, and so um, the, the boulevard on their side of the property is larger than a typical single family home. On the south side, it's about 13 feet. I think at the north point of the property, it is 20 feet. So it is a larger, buff or a larger boulevard. The, only, the reason that that's relevant is uh, kind of how would we view the possibility of actually having to remove any material that was recently planted for a city utility project or sidewalk project whatever the case may be. It is less likely on the basis of the boulevard being larger. That's true. But that being said, those easements are kept in perpetuity because 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we don't know what city staff, we don't know what uh, the priorities of the city will be in terms of extending sidewalks, for example, or doing other projects. And those easements are always kept and utilized for the purpose of future uh, infrastructure projects. So I can't stand here and make a promise that on the basis of the boulevard being larger, that those trees would never need to be removed ever in their uh, future um, uh, in order to construct a public improvement. Um, yeah, so uh, one of the, and I, I failed to mention this during the approved landscape plan, but again, one of the uh, additional benefits of having two rows of plantings in the approved plan was a recognition that the first row was located within those easements so that if they ever had to be removed, there would be material uh, that was installed behind them to continue to serve that buffer purpose. Finally, the last thing I'll say from the staff analysis side of things is that uh, full-on removal of all of the scenic easement and landscaping conditions. I, I've spent a good deal of time working with this uh, resident and applicant. I find him to be a, a, a great guy and uh, good to work with. Um, but that does not preclude him or any owner in the future uh, from ever removing that material. There would never be, there's not a con an active condition of approval that would preclude that at all. And then you would be left with a completely wide open, uh, a completely wide open um, uh, character or vantage of the home. So that provides uh, feedback on the staff analysis side of things. We haven't received any public correspondence uh, on this application. I will know the applicant is here, um, I think, and does plan to make a few remarks. And uh, the other thing I'll say about, uh, the only other thing relevant about public correspondence is he did submit some petitions and survey information. Hopefully you saw that in your packet, um, but that did provide some uh, feedback from the neighborhood. So with that, I'll stand for questions. Very good, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Questions of Mr. Johnson, and then we'll have the applicant come up and talk. Questions? Councilmember Carter, then Councilmember Loman. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Mr. Johnson. I have a question that um, maybe I missed something in the packet, and so it's maybe it's silly, but the project is complete, correct? That's correct, Councilmember Carter. So even if we, if we were to deny tonight, or you know, um, <coughs> be supportive of the staff's recommendation. What would be the consequences of that? Like, would he have to remove trees? Yeah, Mayor Bussey, Councilmember Carter, no, he would not have to remove any trees. He could update the landscape plan uh, in his case to reflect the material that he's already installed. Uh, the consequences, uh, if you will, uh, would be that he would have to establish that second row of plantings and that the scenic easement would remain valid and in place, meaning it's kind of a no touch, uh, leave it wild uh, as the material continues to uh, mature. 
And that would be kind of up on that top part, right? There. Correct. Yep. Okay. But the trees and the bushes on the bottom would stay as they are, that, even though they're in the right of way. That's correct. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. That's all my questions now. Yep, I, no thank problem. you for clarifying. I, it felt kind of like a silly question, but I'm like, am I understanding this correctly? So thank you. Let's remember Loman. Thank you, Mayor. There are, there are no silly questions. <laughs> In this council member's opinion. Um, if uh, we were to, if this council were to uh, remove the, 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 the two requirements that are there, um, and uh, let's say the trees were removed at some future uh, period, point of time, would that change the, uh, uh, the, you know, in terms of that locality piece that we talk about, um, in terms of that, that standard within that neighborhood? Or it, is there a threshold that you have to get to where you have so many properties that are within that, that wooded character, uh, characterization where you get to a point where, okay, now we've kind of tipped the balance, so now you know, it doesn't make sense to kind of have the, these standards that we have uh, for that area. Does that make sense in terms of what, what I'm asking? I, th I think so, uh, Mayor. Uh, Councilmember Lohman, um, I mean, to be fair, the variance pr process is, can be more of an art than a science sometimes, and I think that to a degree, um, you know, uh, some of the analysis that you do on every required finding to a degree can be subjective. Um, you know, that being said, uh, I think it's uh, to staff and staff's judgment, um, the way that we see what is kind of defining the essential character in this neighborhood has to do with its wooded nature. Um, now, uh, in fairness to the, to the Lee Wood, to these six lots, whenever you have uh, six lots that are constructed in 2000 versus homes that are built in the 50s and 60s, it's very hard to match that character, right? You're going to cut down some trees to create some building pads. You're going to do some grading. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I think that's why you see some of these conditions put forth is that it's really trying to recreate or restore uh, what the essential character of the neighborhood is and kind of in line with that spirit. So then in, in that, to lead, lead to the next piece, so in, in terms of looking at this, should I be looking at this in terms of five, six properties with, you know, w with respect to, uh, uh, you know, to this this requirement that we've got around the wooded uh, piece, um, uh, or should I be looking at this five plus one? Yeah, Mayor Councilmember Malone, I think you should just be analyzing it with this individual lot. Um, the other lots do have a scenic easement, and they were part of the same platting process, but it was a separate action that created the scenic easement in this case. Um, there is some slightly different uh, characteristics of the western side of this lot versus the northern side of the others um, that may or may not be relevant to that discussion. Uh, but yeah, the, I think you should be solely focused on this property and the analysis by which you're kind of making your decision is, um, you know, are these conditions necessary to maintain the essential character of the neighborhood or are they not? I mean, that's really kind of, uh, if, if I'm trying to put it in the simplest of approach or yes or no terms. Thanks. Just two real quick more here. And we talk about practical difficulty. Um, I noticed as we were looking at this, I was, it wasn't clear to me. I wasn't here when, you know, when they did this originally, mm -hmm. uh, Where's the backyard of this guy? I mean, or, or the the backyard uh, when I look at this this property. Yeah, Mayor Councilmember Loman, good question. So yeah, and, and I think what what you what you see uh, that zoning conundrum that I identified in the right. beginning of the presentation has to do with that very issue, and that's why uh, staff and the hearing examiner and ultimately council approving the variance uh, recognizes that practical difficulty. So there's the practical difficulty. What are the what is the characteristics of this lot that make it unique, and why is it a challenge from a zoning perspective? Why can't they enjoy this property like uh, a typical single-family residential lot? Uh, and then there's the maintenance of the essential character piece, and I think it's that that latter finding that you're seeing some of those conditions of approval that were attached in 2003 and 2019, or excuse me, 2021. Uh, that are more tied to the essential character piece than the practical difficulties uh, piece, if that makes sense. And so when I'm thinking about the practical difficulty, that has to do with the variance, not with the historical, uh, not so, so the scenic uh, preservation, right? That has Correct. to do with the, the, the variance piece of it, not the uh, sort of, can I, uh, I'll come back to that later when we get into our discussion. Uh, my, my final piece here um, that I just wanted to make sure that I, I understand it, um, the failure to record, how am I to look at that in terms of, um, uh, you know, b both the variance 
and this the, the what we've got before us here as as a council. Yeah, good question, Mayor Councilmember Lohman. Um, uh, I don't know how it was handled back then, so uh, stipulate to that that was you know 19 years ago or so. Um, on most, in the case of most easement, city staff would uh, follow and pursue the recording of, cer of certain documents. That's not always the case with development nowadays with our current policies and procedures. There's site development agreements. There's other types of easements and agreements that the developer or the applicant is uh, required to record and provide proof of recording. Uh, at minimum, you know, a staff level involvement would have been receiving that proof of recording, even if uh, the the developer or owner in this case was Anthony Eden Holmes, was the applicant of the original uh, variance, um, who was the developer of the subdivision. But where it got lost in the, I can't pin down anybody, uh, I can't find anybody who is uh, names on the staff report kind of thing who was involved. So, but so should I should I consider that at all, or is that just that's just a fact of the, the case? Move on. Uh, Mayor Councilmember Lohman, from my perspective, the easement was established with a purpose, whether it was recorded or not. Does that does that eliminate the essential purpose of it? I don't think it does, but uh, you know that's kind of up to your own analysis. Councilmember D'Alessandro, and then Councilmember Nelson. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I think it. Um, uh, I think uh, I'd like you to move to the one of the pictures, the side by side pictures, not the one with the winter. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So um, this was in 2013. This is in 2021, right? Okay. Um, so there are trees that go all the way to the road. Who belongs to those trees? Yeah, Mayor Councilman Dulce. All right, who do those trees belong to? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Tree Mayor hugger Council in me, sorry. <laughs> Uh, Mayor Councilor D'Alessandro, uh, at some point, typically, like if I'm thinking about the midpoint of this property, 18 feet behind the curb or so, if the tree is within that boundary, it would be in public right away, and it would be the city's tree. Um, uh, I know some trees were removed from uh, the public right away. My understanding is that they consulted with the city forester on some of that work. Um, so it, it is a city tree, but I think some of them, you know, in the case where you have a tree that may or may not pose a hazard to a house, for example, the city forester might be called out. If he concurs with the homeowner's concern, then maybe they would work to remove it uh, or work on that. Um, but yes, along the roadway, it's a city tree, at which point the front boundary, behind the front boundary, it's the, the residence tree. So so I guess where I'm looking at with this, it, and I know that the, the pictures aren't exactly in the same angle, but to me, it doesn't look like, aside from the stuff that's close to the road, it doesn't look to me like it's materially different, meaning you have all of this green space in the front, Right, it was there prior. Um, there's no, there's no forestry characterization or characteristic in that area. Right? Um, was that done because the city required that to be vacant, like it is? And, yeah, and Mayor Councilor Del Sandro, this is another area of this case where uh, we don't have perfect record keeping. And so, um, from talking to um, some staff who may have been in and around the arena of, of this at that time, but didn't work specifically on this case, I think there was some expectation on the part of the developer that they would have, that they maintain more trees in that scenic area, uh, scenic easement area than they did. And so, I think that's where the first fundamental uh, problem occurred. Uh, in fairness to the current residents, there was other encroachments into that easement area previously that went unnoticed by staff or uh, city officials. Um, so, you know, that's, that's part of the story. Uh, I'm certainly not uh, denying that. Um, but, yeah, I think that's kind of where some of the um, mix-up is a little bit. Okay. And, and so um, when I look at this picture, um, what I'm what – I'm, maybe, I, maybe I can't see it in the 2021 picture, but um, are, you, can you, are you able to articulate for me if you needed to put a sidewalk – I, and I, I understand, let's look at our current sidewalk requirements. If it was a 20-foot wide sidewalk, that would be a different conversation. I understand that. But in this particular case, um, it seems to me that the majority of the trees that you would take out, the city might have to take out, um, they, they've, been, they've, they've been kind of cleaned out, and they're actually set back further now than they were in this 2013 picture. Is that a fair characterization? Am I... Looking at that, I mean, would you take out more trees 
just to put a sidewalk in, it looks to me like there's a lot of room is I guess what I'm saying, but I obviously I'm not an engineer and I don't know what I'm looking at here. <laughs> yeah, Mayor Councilman Del Sandra, that's a perfect time to say that I'm not an engineer either. <laughs> and uh, um, you're correct. I know that public works, you know, first and foremost attempts to save trees. The city engineer is here too, if yeah. she wants to speak to it. Uh, but there's other projects other than just sidewalks, I guess. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Member D'Alessandro, um, that area also has a slope. Mm -hmm. So in order to put in the sidewalk, it is possible that we would need to either remove the trees, install a retaining wall, or grade out into that easement area. So mm -hmm. without doing the actual design, I can't say what we're going to sure. remove. Um, and the other thing I think I'd point out with that green space, this... Uh, easement for the scenic easement is weird in the aspect that it's only 150 feet long it doesn't include this grass space that was always intended to be grass space i don't know how that came about either yeah okay thank you i appreciate it i i'm i'm, I'm looking at this and i'm struck by um why that isn't the concern when it comes to the 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 requirements for uh, wooded areas? It seems like mowed grass is like the antithesis of wooded areas to me. So I'm just curious about that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a few, hopefully, quick questions. Um, so I think anyone looking at this property looks at this as the backyard, and I think you dealt with that a little bit. What would the normal standards for a backyard be? What would the setback be? What would be the requirements for screening on a backyard anywhere else in the city? Yeah, thank you for that question, Mayor Councilmember Nelson. I'm going to pull up the approved plan again because it helps kind of get to that a little bit. Um, so, uh, a pool setback, if this, the, the way that the variants dealt with this is we kind of envisioned it like it was a through lot. So, you, on a through lot, you've got public streets on both sides of the lot. And then when you have a through lot, uh, the, the rear yard uh, setback for a swimming pool would be 30 feet. Um, I forget what the specific, uh, the applicant might be able to tell me, but what the specific dimension of the decking is. There's a different setback for the pool deck versus the water itself, just to get into more okay. uh, nuance. Um, but the pool deck is at a 22-foot setback. So it was a little bit of... Uh, um, do Sean, do you, well, he'll, he'll maybe fill us in later when he speaks. But uh, the point being is that the intent there was to try and mirror as match as closely as possible what the setback requirement was for a through lot. I don't recall if they made it or if they didn't make it. I forget what that width of the deck is on the west side uh, there. Five foot. Five foot. So that, that means the pool is set back 27 feet, and that matches my recollection that it was not just the front yard issue. It was also a, a modest setback uh, variance as well. Okay. And then, um, but the, the pool part is already approved. What would the requirements be for the landscaping? Are there any screening requirements normally in a backyard uh, for people to put trees or anything else there? Yeah, uh, Mayor Councilman Nelson, there typically would not be. Uh, it's not required uh, to screen a swimming pool. Um, uh, that being said, it's not uncommon to attach screening conditions of approval associated with a variance application. Um, all right, thank you. And then the it looked like there were three main concerns um, with the scenic easement uh, tree protection. How many trees were there previously, and how many trees are there now? Yeah, that's a uh, Mayor Councilman Nelson. That's a good question. Um, I forget the exact number of trees that were installed. Unfortunately, again. Um, I'd, I, if there's one thing I can communicate to you tonight is that we are doing a fantastic job with our record keeping uh, <laughs> in terms of our zoning case files. But I was not able to locate the approved landscape plan uh, in 2003. And again, getting back to my point about I think that there was some expectation of more tree preservation in that area okay. that was not followed through. That's more anecdotal, but uh, leave that as it may. In terms of the number of trees that were actually planted, again, the applicant might be able to shed some light, but I think there was probably something like eight trees okay. there. Seven. Seven, okay. There Seven. And now there's, if I understand correctly, 13. That's correct. Okay. Yep. And then the second issue that was raised was uh, the slopes and that. Are there any concerns about erosion based on what is there right now? Again, uh, stipulating I'm not an engineer, but I would say no. Correct. Okay. 
Okay. And so then the last issue which you've spoke to quite extensively is the character of it. Is mm-hmm. it wooded enough? Is it wooded as much as was expected? Is it the right type or, you know, is it in the right alignment to make that work? So I think that seems to be the essential issue, if, if I'm understanding it correctly. There's two, I guess, if I may, um, there's two comments I would make to that is that, again, with a single row of plantings, if some of those plantings are removed for any reason, you're losing that with no backup. There's no uh, backstop there. And the second issue is uh, concentrating the same amount of material in one strip versus two strips, if you will, uh, in easy terms. Um, It does create the potential for some of that material to get crowded over time as it all begins to mature and grow into one another. And I think that was one of the issues, actually, that... Uh, uh, informed some of the poor tree health uh, for the trees that were removed is that they were planted too close together and ultimately got crowded out. Um, okay. Makes sense. Um, I think I have other questions here. Uh, so uh, do we have any projects with regards to sidewalks, bark, barkways, bikeways, utilities, or anything else in those easements within our CIP, our alternative transportation plans, or any other city plans that we see? I mean, because I know those are pretty far out looking. Do we see anything coming down the pipeline for those? I, I don't believe so, no. Okay. The answer is no. Okay. Thanks. I was, double, I was confirming with double. Cool. <laughs> um, Trust last clarify. question I have, and, and hopefully I don't get the homeowner in trouble here, but um, what about the fence? It seems to be the in that area too. What? Yes. So Mayor Bussey, Councilor Nelson, there was uh, for both the retaining wall that was constructed in the approved plans and the fencing, uh, there was a uh, exception in the scenic easement that those structures were kind of uh, uh, pushed along in. I don't want to use the term grandfathered in because it's a separate concept, but they were allowed to be there by exception uh, with the hope that the rest of it would become wooded and natural over time. Okay. Yep. Good. Thank you. Council, additional questions? Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to uh, make sure I understand this correctly. So if we were, if, um, if we were to uh, remove these conditions, and that, that's actually, that's the very picture I want. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Um, so right now, it's, it's just that lower row of, of um, trees. Don't know what other term I was looking for there. Um, if we were to remove these conditions, then then my understanding is that there there would be then no requirement for any kind of trees to be located in in that scenic easement. Am I correct on that, Mayor Councilor Coulter? That's correct. Okay. Recognizing that thirteen trees have been planted, but the city has no authority to regulate what happens to them in the future. That yeah, and that and that was my follow up question. Then is that that this. Um, this this variance the um this language stays with the land correct? correct so so you know if in at some future date this property is sold and and redeveloped in whatever manner or or just some there there would be no requirement that there would be that kind of those kind of trees there or any trees for that matter mayor councilor Coulter, that's correct okay thank you just wanted to clarify that Council, if there's nothing additional, maybe we'll bring the applicant up and hear what he has to say. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but I'm going to stutter and stammer my way through this. Very good. Quick. You can officially identify yourself for the record, so we have it, and we'll go from there. Sean Husett, owner of 7981 Lee Circle. <coughs> Welcome. Uh, When my wife and I bought the house in 2017, we were unaware about the 30-foot scenic easement because the paperwork was never filed with the court in 2003. We also did not know our backyard was zoned as our front yard. Only after months of working with city planning did we find out about these issues. Had we known, we probably wouldn't have bought the property or moved to Bloomington. That being said, we love our house, we love our pool project and how it turned out, and we love our community. Uh, We are asking to complete our 2021 variance and have a clear title like we did when we purchased it in 2017. Our variance was approved um, April 19th, 2021 by City Council. We received a call from Nick Johnson on June 1st, 2021 at 8.30 that our 2003 variance was never recorded into Hennepin County Courthouse. This was the same day that North Star Tree Service had just cut down all of our trees at 7 a.m. that morning. 
At this point, we had started our project, put down payments with our pool contractor, landscaper, and subcontractors. We felt pressured by the city to add the scenic easement to our mortgage and title company. If we did not sign the scenic easement on June 3rd, we would not be able to get our pool permit and risk losing our down payments and delaying our project another year. This is the reason we did not know about the scenic easement when buying the house or until we later inquired about the landscaping project. Our home essentially did not have a recorded scenic easement from 2003 to 2021. With regard to the scenic easement, the city talks about essential character of the neighborhood being wooded. But if the trees come down from a storm, get cut down by a homeowner, or get diseased or die on Lee Road, homeowners are not required to replant, only we are. The six homes on Lee Circle Development are the only ones on Lee Road to have a scenic easement and are held to a higher standard. There are also a few lots the city owns further down on Lee Road with little to no trees on the property adhering to the wooded Lee Road standard. This project started in 2020 because the seven trees that were planted as part of the 2003 variants were diseased and dying because they were planted too close and not maintained by the previous homeowner. In 2003, we understand that the neighborhood was not supportive of the contractor building six homes. But on page 114 City Council agenda packet pertaining to the 2003 variants, then City Senior Planner Bob Hobbaker said, and I quote, five to eight trees is the appropriate number, but 10 foot height is not. He said tall mature evergreen trees probably would not do well. A smaller three to eight foot tree will grow faster and have a better chance of survival. He would not suggest planting arborvitaes for the in this area, end quote, referring to how many trees are needed in the scenic easement. But in 2021, when the neighborhood was supportive of our project, 13 trees are now required. In 2021, I went up and down door to door on Lee Road and talked to all the homeowners about removing the scenic easement and got support for our project. I received 40 homeowner signatures in support. That is all the homes on Lee Road except for two. One was out of town and later called and said he would support us. The other was under construction owned by the contractor. <laughs> City planning states that 13 trees are located in the drainage and utility easement, which is true. But the city owns 14 to 18 feet to the north, expanding to, from the curb to the fence. All the utilities are located on city property three to four foot from the curb, not 20 foot east on our property. I also asked her in one of the WebEx meetings about paying for and planting and maintaining additional trees in the city property and was denied by the engineering department. The six trees that were proposed on the, to be planted on the wall were one maple, two ornamental drag, jack dwarf pear trees, and three arborvitaes recommended by city planning. Again, on page 114, of the agenda packet referring to the 2003 variants, Bob Hobbaker states, and I quote, as far as arborvitae, it does not tolerate climate well, end quote. And from personal experience, deer love to eat our current arborvitaes, which does not grow back and destroys the trees. At one point, city planning wanted 16 trees replaced from our seven trees that we cut down. Then there was talk of 10 trees, then we agreed to 13 trees. Planning of the tree locations was the most difficult part of our project. We got to a place with Nick that we thought would work for our project. This was our first landscape and pool project and we ran into some unexpected issues that we did not plan for with our discussions with city planning. Planning on, planting on the top of the wall risked damage to our main sprinkler line that connects the north side of our sprinkler zones to the south side of the sprinkler zones and also risked damage to the underground pool supply lines and the electrical wires. We felt along with our pool contractor and our landscaper that 13 trees on the lower wall would offered the best coverage for privacy and not damage our pool and sprinkler system in the future. In closing, we have a one-year-old daughter and a four-year-old son. I have 60 years left to earn my Bloomington City pension. We're not planning on moving or selling for the next 20 years. We want privacy just as much as our neighbors. As much as I spent on the trees, I will not cut them down. If they disease or die, I will replace them. I'm hoping to replace the trees without meeting with city planning, city managers, and city council to decide species, shape, or tree size. Thank you for your time. Thank you much. Uh, appreciate it and appreciate your coming forward and continuing this discussion. I'm sure some folks have some questions here on all of this. Um, the first takeaway that I had, uh, you, starting the tree removal at 7 a.m., I bet you were real popular that day in the neighborhood. <laughs> so, they were quick. They were quick. Good, good, good. I uh, appreciate that you've been working back and forth with staff on this and, and tried to work through all this. And it actually, it's a, it's a good-looking project. I think you've done a nice job with it. Uh, but you were, when, when they 
when we talked about this last time, and I remember when this came before the council previously, and realizing that the scenic easement hadn't been filed, and we were trying to move things along, and I think there was a deadline, if I'm wasn't, if I'm not mistaken, and so I think the council was very supportive of, of the project at that time, um, and I'm pretty sure with the um, the requirements that were there, I mean, you knew that there was going to be that number of trees that were required. That, that that's what the the conditions were. That's what was stipulated, right? And everybody kind of agreed to that when when right. we had that meeting and it kind of went forward. And when you made the decision to reduce that number of trees, so 13 were required and you planted how many? 13. 13. How many were originally? 13. 13. So originally, before we moved in, there were seven there. So you planted 13. I'm, I, did I, I, see, I saw 13 trees planted there? Correct. Said, okay. Right. But I'm actually adding one more to the south side. Yes, I, I was mistaken. I thought there was fewer than the 13 yeah. that were. No, we planted all 13, 13 just on the lower level. On the lower level. Got it, got it. I, I um, consulting with our uh, landscape designer, he said that would offer better privacy got it. and better screening, which is ultimately what the scenic easement was for. Got it. I, I misunderstood that. I thought it was 13, and, and you reduced that number to get them on the lower level and make sure everything fit in. No, we planted all 13. Understood. Uh, appreciate that. Um, that. That was going to be a question that I had. Do others have questions here on Councilmember Martin and Councilmember Loma? Councilmember Martin. Uh, uh, again, thank you for this information and the email you'd sent. Um, in terms of removing those diseased trees because they were planted too close together, with the 13 all now on one road, did your landscape designer have concerns about the crowding out? He did not. Um, because there are two different varieties, one's a maple and one is a blue spruce, so one's going to be higher up, one's going to be lower. Um, the other seven that were planted there were all pine trees and were very acidic and were never really taken care of, and so basically they all grew together and, and died. Okay. Put that up for you. And, and just a, a brief follow-up to that. Does um, staff verify a, a report like that from the landscape? Uh, designer to say yes this makes sense it's just kind of two different sets of information about tree health here in terms of shadows and long-term viability of the shorter plants that was to me or to uh, I guess that's maybe more to, to staff I guess has that been yeah. verified do we uh, that no uh, the information was in the packet from the landscape uh, designer I don't believe it's been reviewed by Dave Hansen for example or city forester uh, to verify the kind of design criteria that you're talking about okay thank you for yeah. that I appreciate it <coughs> Councilmember Lohman. Uh, two questions for you. Um, <clears throat> the second row, uh, was there a reason why? Because I know in the landscaping plan that, that staff, during the last variance uh, piece, had laid out there were two rows. Mm -hmm. uh, wh why just go with the one row as opposed to following with the, uh, the second row? So when we initially discussed this, uh, we got to that area where we could live with that. Um, our main sprinkler line ran a lot lower to the ground, and so they had to bring it above the wall. So basically, it runs the entire way of that nine foot between the retained wall and the pool, um, right down the middle. So that we'd have an issue with roots getting into the sprinkler systems that connect the north side to our south side. Also, when you know, this was our first landscaping project, I didn't know that there was going to be electrical wires underneath going to the pumps. I didn't know there was going to be intake. PVC pipes underneath there. So by the time you do that, then you're just cramming more stuff into one little area. Um, and so it, down the road, I didn't want to have issues with my pool that I spent a bunch of money on that roots are getting into just to put trees in. Makes sense. So no, I just wanted to be sure I overheard because I thought, I thought you said um, uh, during your presentation uh, that Bob Howbaker, who used to be the planning manager um, here at the city, mm -hmm. had recommended five to eight. Uh, so if you look at the variance for 2003 that was in the agenda packet, I pulled that directly from there. That was his quotes. Um, I believe there was one of the two of the neighbors in the backyard or behind us, front yard, backyard, um, were there as well talking about it. And so he recommended not doing arbor varieties because they're not conducive to the area. And he thought five to, to, to seven was a good number to have on there. And that's going to be a question I want to ask staff uh, <clears throat> when you're done. But I just want to verify that that I heard that correctly. I thought I read that, but I just wanted to be sure that I heard that. So, sure. And you. part of our, our issue when we were kind of going back and forth, we thought it was difficult that you know we stepped ahead of that. We had seven trees, but then they wanted us to do 16 trees in a smaller area. Um, we didn't want to have to, every 10 years, cut down the trees, replant, because they're not surviving. So, Thank you. Councilmember Coulter. 
Thank you, Mayor. And I'm sorry, I know this is time to be to ask questions of the applicant, but Nick, could you come back up? Just a quick question. I just want to make sure I'm – something's not clicking here for me. And am, am I correct in understanding that – so, this, I mean, this – this image right here is essentially the landscaping plant, the landscaping as it exists currently. And in, in order for that, I mean, in order, do we need to remove these conditions in order for that to, I don't know what the word is that in order for that to conform with city requirements and all of that. Uh, Mayor, uh, Councilmember Coulter, I, I think this exhibit or this plan that was submitted is more just for reference purposes. It wouldn't be uh, the, the the owner or the resident wouldn't be uh, tied to this plan for perpetuity if the conditions are removed. It's more <coughs> for information purposes to demonstrate and show that this is what was planted. Okay. Okay. So, and and then just a quick follow up to that. Am I correct in understanding? I mean, I, I understand that the sort of the expectation was the two rows. But there is nothing in that variance or anything that is that requires that. Am I correct in that? Uh, Mayor Councilmember Coulter, that's not correct. The current uh, condition uh, does include language about uh, evenly or distributed on the oh upper yes. and lower wall. That's right. So that kind of in, infers or implies that there'll be two rows of plantings. And then the uh, plan that was approved as part of the case fall prior to the, the pool permit being issued reflects that as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And that that I. Appreciate that because that that no gets at, at why I something I wanted to ask. So, um, so there are these the the conditions related to the two rows of trees, and I I mean I get why you don't want to do two rows of trees. I my parents had a pool growing up, and I know all the pipes and all of that. I guess my my question, <coughs> excuse me, is so you're you're also asking that we eliminate this scenic easement, and I I guess it's not. It's not clear to me what what is the purpose of eliminating the scenic easement. I mean, I get you don't have plans to cut down the trees anyway, but that's the part that I'm not understanding. Um, basically, when we bought the property in 2017, it wasn't recorded on there. We didn't know about it, and now adding that on there, 20 years from now, it may be a bigger deal for resale. Um, and with the language, just to take that off, I figured it'd just be a clean way to have a clean title and be done with our variance and complete it with the city. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. I think that's all the questions I have for now. Thank you. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> and just a point of clarity, you said in your statement that no other houses in the area, except for those that were built as part of this new little subdivision, have the scenic easements. Correct. Even though it's all wooded area, a woody, woodsy neighborhood, your six houses are the only ones that have the scenic easements. Correct. Okay. And over the last 20 years, there's we've had a lot of storm damage. We lose trees all the time. We have overhead wires, so anytime a tree falls down, we lose power. Um, it's been thinning and thinning, but again, yes, we're the only ones that are obligated to replant. Got it. Thank you. Councilmember D'Alessandro? Is... Uh, I think you might have just answered my question, so I'll just confirm. The 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 requirement to have the scenic e easement puts you uh, you responsible for replacing trees should they be damaged. Is that the main is that the main challenge? Correct. Okay. Um, you know, this whole process has been very difficult just with the requirements of the lot and stuff that happened before we even purchased it. Um, you know, if a tree should die. I don't want to have to go to Nick all the time and say, Nick, we have to take this tree out, get the city forester out there to look at it, then plant one that's this high, this. I, I'd rather just take care of it and maintain my yard. I take great pride in my front yard, backyard, make sure everything's mowed, looking good, and you know, I think we can make it look great. Um, point, of, point of note, when I visited the property, I, I think Sean was out there mowing the part that's not even his out there that's a grass that looks like a putting green, and I don't know why, but okay. Um, uh, uh, the other piece of that then is it, just a point of clarification. You're, because your backyard, front yard concept is on Lee Road, you are literally the only the only house on Lee Road that has required a scenic easement. Is that correct? Correct. And that goes 40 houses, 50 houses, something like that, right? Correct. Okay, thanks. Council, anything additional? Oh, very good. To have a seat, we're going to open the public hearing. We'll see if anybody has any additional questions or comments, and we may get back to you here shortly. Great. Thank, Thank you for your time. You.
So we've heard from the applicant, now we've heard from the, uh, the staff report as well. I'd like to open the public hearing on item 4.2. This is uh, regarding the pool variance at 7981 Leah Circle, and it's uh, for the change of conditions. Is there anyone here in the council chambers who wishes to speak to item 4.2? I don't see anyone coming forward. Nora, do we have anyone on the phone who wishes to speak to item 4.2? Again, Mr. Mayor, still no participants at this time via phone line. You may continue. Thank you. Last call for anybody in the council chambers? Seeing no one coming forward, council, I would look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.2. So moved. Second. Motion by council member Lohman, second by council member D'Alessandro to close the public hearing on item 4.2. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 7-0. So, council, discussion on this. Um, the question are the question is on the uh, the two conditions of approval, the the total of 13 trees, the question of whether or not evenly distributed, and then I think um, a more relevant question: the revised scenic easement, the scenic easement that is in place now. Do we keep that in place, or do we move that? Councilmember Loman. Oh, I just had one one question um, of staff about that that scenic uh, piece, and what I just wanted to understand is. Uh, um, uh, will there be any impact at all uh, or legal consequences of granting a full variance or, and removal of that scenic easement uh, to this property that we're looking at uh, to other uh, properties that have that scenic uh, um, uh, requirement uh, that's out there? Those other five that are in that area and then the other, I think you mentioned, Nick, 40 other properties that are, that are out there, uh, roughly or so, uh, those pieces. So I'm just I'm curious um, about that. Yeah, Mayor Councilmember Lohman, as I noted in my earlier remarks, I'd, I would estimate that there's, you know, 35 of these documents around town. Some of them apply to one single property, like in this case. Some of them apply to multiple properties um, in, in, you know, a wide variety of geographic areas around the city. Um, and, you know, there isn't a exact slope number or an exact number of trees or the age of the trees. Uh, really, it was done on a case-by-case -case basis, taking into the, into the um, uh, analysis the local characteristics and criteria of the site they were looking at, or the area, I should say. So as far as what the implications are, um, you know, this singular one versus others, um, I, think it, I think it depends on uh, what your uh, guidance and findings would be for the removal. Um, should you pursue that action versus uh, what are the differences in these other uh, scenic easements around town, the 35 others? So, um, you know, I, to approve this change of condition, I think uh, what staff would um, uh, guide you is that what the analysis you're performing is that um, that action would not, uh, would not uh, prevent or would not kind of, um, I'm, I'm kind of blanking on what the right word is, but they would not, in other words, apply to all those other uh, easements that are around town. Forgive me, I had a big word to ask. Yeah, no there. problem. And so what I, what I just want to be clear that I hear, I'm hearing what you're saying here is that this, this uh, one area is kind of in and of itself its own. And since that scenic uh, uh, slope requirement, the scenic uh, protection is not you know, other than just this property and the, the five properties, not generally in the rest of that area, uh, that this is really, we're just looking at this property in and of itself. I think, to, yeah, to tonight's action, I would guide you that the analysis you're making is specific to this scenic easement only. Any other uh, action that the city council would take on any other scenic easement in the city would involve its own individual set of analysis and circumstances that would be presented to you as to why or why not it's appropriate to keep it or remove it or whatever the case may I be. I appreciate that. And Mayor, with that being said, um, I guess the problem that I, I run into is uh, uh, when we look at this whole scenic piece here, it is strange to me that only six properties in this entire area, if, if we as the city say that this is important to uh, uh, protect uh, this particular idea, that only six properties uh, have this. This just really doesn't make sense to me. And, and I think this ought to be the beginning of removing all of this uh, in the entire area um, uh, to remove that. Uh, because if if we only see that these six need it, um, but yet we don't have that requirement for the rest of the area um, and it's wooded, that to me really doesn't make any sense at all. Um, and then in terms, and I think that's what we're just talking, having a conversation about right now, right? And I'll stop there. Then. Council Member D'Alessandro and then Council Member Carter. I just have a... a Nick, I'm sorry, can I ask you to come back? Absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, um, 
let's say we remove the uh, these uh, um, requirements. At, what's what's left for the property owner to do with the city? Uh, is there are there more fees? Are there more? Is there more paperwork? Like what what's the what's the follow up? Let's you know if uh, if we do approve um, the vacation of these things, um, what what what's next? Yeah, Mayor Councilor D'Alessandro, so uh, typical of any development project, this is only a single family home, of course, but with all development projects that have a required landscaping component, we collect a landscaping surety, uh, basically a bond that uh, ensures that the material gets planted and that it's healthy for a certain period of time, and then we release it back to the owner. So the owner has submitted the surety uh, in the value of the 13 trees that was required by the case. If the condition or the requirement gets removed, the city could just return that surety to them, and then that would be kind of, oh, excuse me, the end of the... Um, the end of the ride, so to speak. Okay, so there's <clears throat> there's no expectation we collect any more fees or anything like that from the property owner. I, I you know, I, I only work in one department division, but I hesitate to say I think that's correct. Okay. Um, yeah. And I, if I point of just a quick statement, uh, Councilor Loman, I don't mean to uh, rebut anything you mentioned uh, in your previous statement, but one thing I would just add for your consideration, as opposed to all of the scenic easements all around town and when they were added. I think in some cases to say there's no scenic easements uh, in the neighborhood, sometimes that's more of a characteristic or reflection of when those homes were built and platted and subdivided versus uh, whether or not it was appropriate or not, it met the criteria or not of a scenic easement. So I think, I think different eras of Bloomington development, some have had more scenic easements, some have had less, put it that way. And I, I don't mean that uh, in any disrespectful way, it's just, just a comment. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I just want to make sure that we're really clear. We are not voting on removing the scenic easement tonight. We are voting to change the conditions of approval. If they want to remove a scenic easement, then they have to submit an application for that, right? That's correct. Mayor, uh, Councilmember Carr, thank you for that point of clarification. There is a formal application by which uh, easements are removed. So if you're re removing it, you deal with it all the time. The public hearings, the last one minute, and it's a drainage and utility easement here, X. Um, he would, they would have to go through that same process, and there would be a fee <laughs> associated with that process, technically, now that I think of it. Um, but there's also a public hearing requirement associated with that. So uh, in, discussing, in discussing with staff, it made sense to hold off on doing that formal part of it until after the conditions were uh, acted upon by council. Uh, okay, I, would, I was going to start my comments, but I know that it's related. Follow up, if you don't mind, on your question, Councilmember Carter. Councilmember D'Alessandro, quick one. Yeah, just... Um, so the easement hasn't been recorded, but he would have to apply to remove an easement that was never recorded. The, pardon me, Mayor, correct? Councilman okay. Del Sandro, just, the, 20, the 22 foot wide easement reflecting ah, okay. last year's yep. case has been recorded. Okay, understood. Thank you. Yep. Council Member Carter. Great, thank you. Um, so I guess when I think about the two conditions that are related, one to the essential character of the neighborhood, um, you know, I guess I would argue in my mind that he, um, met that requirement by planting 13 trees, even though they're not in the exact location. And I completely understand his concerns of putting them on that top level, um, you know, his concerns related to his own utilities, the sprinkler system and the pool infrastructure. Uh, so I guess for me, I'm not really swayed by that argument. Um, I also feel like it's a little bit more subjective, which is makes it more challenging. Um, so, so that's my perspective on that. And then related to the right-of-way, uh, because he does have a larger boulevard, or because there is a larger boulevard there, the city has a larger boulevard there, and that, uh, and there are already trees there, and there are no anticipated projects, I'm not super concerned about that at this time. And so um, I plan actually not to support the staff's recommendation and to um, let this project live on as is. I think it would be... Um, you know, I can't imagine the feeling of being required to plant trees in an area on my property where I know it's going to damage infrastructure that I've spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on. And so uh, I think in this case, although I understand staff's perspective and staff's analysis, um, I do want to be as supportive as possible to this homeowner um, and really appreciate all of the um, effort and resources that he's already put into his home. It looks beautiful, um, and and he's done a great job. And so that's my position. Thank you. 
Councilmember Martin and Councilmember Coulter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I'm along the same lines of thought, but I also come back to that kind of top level standard of uh, maintaining characteristic of the neighborhood. Uh, and I, I see a whole lot of signatures from everybody else in the neighborhood saying what he's got is pretty much there. This makes sense to us. Uh, and that's the neighborhood. So uh, I guess I, I don't want to dictate to them what they think their, their character is. Uh, and on top of that, my, my one concern here uh, that I guess didn't get quite clarified um, with regards to potentially squeezing that many trees at different heights on and concerns about shading and the health of the shorter trees, uh, considering it sounds like our team and Dave Hansen didn't have a chance to verify that those shorter trees are going to do poorly over the long term. All I have to go on is the landscape architect and them saying, sure, go ahead and do it. Uh, that that doesn't seem to be a real concern either. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd say pretty similar. Let them roll with it. That's Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> well, it's interesting. I, you know, as I sat here listening to to staff and the applicant and, and <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, I honestly, I went back and forth on this multiple times. And it, it's, um, it's one of those things where I say it's really interesting and my, my wife's like, that's not very interesting. But, um, <laughs> it, you know, because to my mind, I, I sort of came into this thinking, I mean, this, this was, you know, uh, these were the, the conditions that were agreed to that, that were adopted by the city council and, and all of that. And I, so, you know, to my mind, I think, well, there has to be a pretty compelling reason to remove these, these conditions. And, you know, to, to be honest, I'm, I'm not thinking about it that way. I, I can't necessarily say that these are particularly compelling reasons to make those changes. But then I thought about it some more because, you know, I, I think to the point that Councilmember Martin made just now, if the purpose is maintaining the characteristics and of the neighborhood, who better to decide that than the folks who live in the neighborhood? And I mean, you know, we all know sometimes you go out and you survey neighbors and, and maybe they don't want to, you know, offend someone or whatever. <coughs> but it, I mean, it, it still seems to me to be, a, a have been a, a pretty positive reception in, in that area. And I think, you know, the other piece to me, and I, you know, I, I think to Nick's point, I, I get that how, you know, how we enforce maintaining that sort of essential characteristic of the neighborhood has changed. You know, clearly when a number of those older houses were build, built, they did not use scenic easements to enforce that, um, and that they did on these six houses. And, and that certainly may not be an indication of whether or not a scenic easement is the right choice, but I think at, at a certain point, we have to say that we should try to be consistent. And I, I think if we are going to say that this wooded characteristic of that neighborhood is important, it needs to be enforced as sort of universally as possible, in, in the same way as universally as possible. So to my mind, either we use a scenic easement or we don't. And I, I just have a hard time saying... Well, if the if that's the character the character of this neighborhood, but that that scenic easement only exists on six properties, that to me does not seem like an effective way to enforce that that for lack of a better term. So I you know I've been going back and forth on this, and it 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 just seems to me that the conditions being what they are, the reality being what it is. Um, and I, I, the last piece I would say, you know, I was, I am concerned about the potential remo removal of those trees in, for whatever reason. I mean, we can't predict the future. We don't know where sidewalks are going to go or what happens next, right? So I am, I am concerned about that. But I think that, again, that goes back to if we're going to use the scenic easement for that purpose to, to ensure that essential character of the neighborhood, then we should probably do that on more than six properties, which we have not. Um, so I, 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 like I said, I, I went back and forth on this and I, I at the end of the day, I, I think it does make sense to remove these conditions. So I, and I respect the work that, that staff has done. And I, I think 
Um, staff did, in full honesty, I think staff did their jobs. I think they they, you know, they they worked consistent with with um, what you know they they feel they have they should do according to city code and all of that. Um, but I I just think it makes more sense to go in a different direction. So I will I will not be supporting staff recommendation. I appreciate everybody's input. Uh, my two cents on this, um, and I, I know a little bit about you know trees and pools and, and backyards and plantings and so on. You've all seen my backyard. You know it, it, we've put it together. Uh, I I think the uh, the condition four regarding the trees. I think frankly I think staggering them is a better idea long term. I I agree. The Colorado blue spruce can grow to 50 feet tall pretty quickly. Uh, I've got three in my front yard that are growing out of control. I'm, never have enough Christmas lights anymore to, to fill those darn things. Uh, so I think that might be an issue. But at the same time, the trees are in. I would not in any way advocate digging them up or moving them or that kind of thing. I, I get that. At the same time, uh, the fifth condition, I think there is value in maintaining the scenic easement for the, for the simple reason that it, it is indeed there. It was put there at some point for a reason. And with the additional properties uh, adjoining it, it it creates a scenic easement. It creates a buffer on Lee Road, and I, and I get that, and I understand why it was there. And what it does, I think, more than anything, is, is provides a little bit of control if the trees should die, if, they're, if there's storm damage, and if it's not the current owner, if it's a future owner that decides, you know what, I kind of like the extra sunlight, or I don't want to do, you know, don't want to replace those trees, then, then uh, that, that scenic easement, though, that, that tree line, that cover is lost. And... Um, so I'd, I'd almost be in favor of splitting the baby here, perhaps saying that uh, leaving, uh, removing condition four but maintaining condition five to maintain the scenic easement I think would be my, my preference in all of this. Council Member Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm sorry, that confuses me because I thought we were not voting on the whether or not to remove the scenic easement. Uh, we're voting on these conditions to do this. So by maintaining the condition, it maintains the scenic <laughs> easement. If we well, the scenic easement would still be in place, though, even if we didn't. We voted to remove both conditions, correct? Or my, this the, the scenic easement would still be there. I would look to staff to answer that and clarify that for us. Yeah, Mayor Bussey, uh, to clarify, the there's a condition of approval on both variances, one from 2003, one from uh, last year, that require a scenic easement. And so the first step to relinquish or to remove that document is to change the condition because otherwise the condition runs with the land is still applicable and then should you choose to go that uh, path um, then the the applicant could then file a formal application to legally remove the easement uh, in an action what's called an easement vacation so it doesn't remove the the scenic easement if we do this tonight it doesn't remove the scenic easement it just removes one layer of requirement or the conditions of condition. approval associated with the variances that were approved Yes, that's what I was understanding. Okay. But then when you made your comments, I was like, wait a second. I'm not sure I understand them. Okay, so I am clear now. Thank you. I saw Councilmember Nelson with a question, then Councilmember Malone. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, Nick, thank you for your work, and I totally understand where your recommendation is coming from based on the current rules, and, you know, I think this body has a little bit more discretion to change the rules, and that's our role, and, and you know, I appreciate the thoughtfulness you did here. I do want to find a way to, to make this work out for the homeowners. Um, and uh, because uh, Jamie and um, city manager of Brugge wasn't here, I thought I'd try to do a thing where I tried to make a compromise, but Mayor Bussey uh, beat me to it. So, um, but in my mind, I was wondering if it might make more sense to keep four, but just reword it so that they were 13. And if we kept that condition, would they need to maintain those? Because it sounds like the homeowner is totally willing to maintain those. And so then, you know, in 20, 25 years, if they did move, um, that the next homeowner would still need to maintain those trees and then, you know, go through the process as uh, council member uh, Carter was talking about of removing that scenic easement over time. I didn't know if that was workable to make sure we protect those trees for the long term. So, yeah, no, please, you got, you're got you on top of it. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. If we did that, though, my understanding would be that he would be required to put trees in that top, on yeah. that upper layer. And I agree with that, which is why my recommendation is to change the language to oh, make God. it evenly on the one layer. Just change the language to meet what is there. 
Got and it. be done with it so that, that that would have to be maintained into the future by, by himself, which he already said he was willing to do. But another homeowner would need to do that as well. Thank and you. then we can sidestep the scenic easement issue. Because I'll be honest, in terms of scenic easements, I think that's a much better thing to have through the deed and not through a city thing. I mean, if you're going to set up a neighborhood and you want to have that type of character, you should put it as a deed restriction. And that's, in my opinion, a more appropriate process for that type of thing. So, so I would look to, uh, to staff, both uh, planning and legal, and ask... Uh, if, if we did try to split it, I mean, would, would, what would be more applicable or what would be, what would um, provide a longer term um, guarantee that it's basically going to be tree lined and, and what we're trying to accomplish here? Which would, be, which would guarantee it better? Uh, maintaining uh, condition four and specifying the 13 trees or maintaining condition five regarding the scenic easement uh, or neither? I mean, I, that, that's still an option, too. We're just trying to figure out what would be best if we tried to find a compromise here. Thoughts? Attorney Zuniga, would you like me to take a first stab, and you can clean up the mess on afterwards? Um, uh, our, our city's legal staff has uh, trained uh, other departments, but planning in particular, because we deal with a lot of development applications, that you're taking action on the application in front of you. So any, uh, you're either approving that application or you're denying that application. Any revision... To, it's not like you're adding a new condition of approval to a plan development, for example, where you have discretion about changing the language or the particulars. Um, any, I, I would be curious of his perspective, but I think uh, if you were going this route of the compromise or revision, um, I think it would necessitate some uh, participation or uh, of the applicant. Um, so just that perspective. Um, as far as uh, if I was tracking you correctly, Councilman Nelson, I think you were saying remove the scenic easement condition, but just and then amend the landscaping condition to just require 13 trees. Is that correct? Yep. As far from a protection standpoint, I guess this is where planning staff would uh, be the right uh, person to ask. Um, from a protection standpoint, uh, a scenic easement is better. Uh, it's writ it's a uh, it follows the not that variances don't but uh, it f it's recorded against the deed ideally and uh, it's a no touch zone it explicitly says signed by the the property owner I'm not allowed to remove these trees or build structures or this that or the other thing in this area uh, as far as landscape conditions as you know when we review other properties for development we look at their approved landscape plan on file and that's at those formal times, we look at what the status of their landscaping is, but that can be for some properties only once every five or every 10 uh, years, whatever the case may be. So uh, I would say that we do, we do evaluate it for zoning letters. You're typically not getting uh, zoning compliance letters on single family homes versus commercial and industrial developments. So we do note if there's missing landscaping on an approved plan for those other properties. But uh, suffice to say that, you know, just tracking an approved landscape plan, uh, staff is not doing an annual inspection of every property of their landscaping, uh, but for zoning compliance letters and other development actions, if that makes sense. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I, I'm, um, I'm struggling. I, I appreciate everybody's work on this. I know that this is the end of a very long road that folks have been on together. And I, I totally appreciate that. And I want to um, I want to commend everybody for. I'll tell you, that, you know, some people uh, would have gotten really frustrated by now. Uh, and so credit to the homeowner and to the departments that everybody's maintained even keel and and a, a you know um, cooperative attitude. Um, since we're all we're doing right now is is vacating these two conditions of approval, I don't feel like it changes the outcome to just go ahead and vacate these two uh, conditions. Um, one, it doesn't remove the actual scenic easement, uh, and two, um, uh, the um, it, if I understand correctly, the planning manager still has to go through and approve the landscape plan. No, nope. it 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 says here. A uh, variety of species as approved by the planning manager. It, did that not happen, or did it already happen? It 
yeah, forgive me, uh, Mayor Councilor Del Sandro. So it did happen already. And what the application before you would do this evening is just remove the landscaping conditions altogether. So the, that plan is uh, basically defunct or um, no longer relevant. The 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 one the one that's in the uh, I understand yes. what you're saying uh, now. Okay, so you're saying. Um, because we said earlier that the landscape architect has said that the trees and everything are good, but we haven't seen them in plan. Is there so this this installed landscaping plan that you have in front of you here was not was not a, was not reviewed by the planning department That's, at all? It, it was yeah. Forgive me, Mayor Councilman Del Sandro. It was re reviewed in so much as it was a uh, uh, a data point or an attachment that informs gives the council information as to what trees were planted. Understood. Uh, the removal of the landscaping condition altogether does not buy the property on an ongoing basis to any landscaping requirement. So it's it's this plan that's on your screen here is really for information purposes, uh, documenting what was installed as of uh, 2022. Okay. Um, so as part of the as part of what would happen next, let's say we vacate these, then here, here's where I'm going to, it seems to me that there's plenty of time for the city to continue to weigh in on this, including up into us coming through with a public hearing and potentially denying their removal of the scenic easement. This is um, materiality to me, not more than um, making sure that what the homeowner has in place is actually, you know, on the books and valid. Um, if that's the case, then if we all like it and we all think it works, it seems to me like there should be no reason for us not to approve it. Councilmember Nelson and then Councilmember Loman, please. Right. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, honestly, I support removing both conditions as well. I was just looking for a, a way to do that um, that seemed consistent with what I heard from the homeowner in terms of his intention of maintaining that. Um, the reality is, is I think the screening is there to protect the homeowner. I don't think it's there to protect the street. Um, so it's, um, you know, they're going to maintain that. You know, you want a private backyard for your kid and family to swim, and I think they're going to take care of that. So I'm, I'm comfortable removing it. I, I don't have a problem with that. I just, you know, if the homeowner was willing to maintain those trees and agree to that, and there was a way to do that consistent with the good work staff did, um, I was open to that as well. But it sounds like we've got maybe a pathway to do that as well through the scenic easement, maybe some further conversations about if there's modifications to protect that for future homeowners that may not be as diligent as the current ones. Council Member Loman. Well, Mayor, <coughs> it appears I'm with you on this, because uh, the issue I find myself on this one is that, you know, if I support the idea of removing this scenic easement, um, what about the other five houses uh, that are out there as well? So um, I, I think that that <clears throat> I can't I can't support you know this change here without looking at those other uh, the, uh, looking at those other five uh, properties. So I'm going to find myself stuck uh, uh, with you on that. It kind of seems like we got you know I mean I'm kind of counting noses. We got five two. <laughs> so I don't know. I think that Mayor, we had a. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm certainly not going to move this, but maybe one of the other five here ought to go ahead and, and, and move this thing. I uh, think uh, I think we are to the point. Uh, I don't know if everything's been said, but everybody's already said it. So it's uh, 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 if there's anyone who wanted to make a uh, motion action. Uh, Mr. Hughes, said you something to add here? Please come on up. Um, one last thing that's not in any of this stuff, but when we, we noticed afterwards, after we signed the scenic easement, it technically says on there, it's a no mow, no sprinkler area. So all that area that's green would not be able to be mowed or have a sprinkler system in it as well. It would just be dead grass. Um, but the section that the city owns, that would be green and mowed. So that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. So, Council? Yeah, I'm happy to make the motion. Council Member D'Alessandro. Um, so, I believe it's the second one, correct? I, yes, that is correct. Okay, to, uh, so I, uh, I'm making a motion to continue the item to the May 23rd City Council meeting and direct staff to prepare a resolution of approval for a change in condition application to remove conditions of approval four and five in case number PL20. 21-62 and conditions of approval three and four in case number 
10633A-03 pertaining to landscaping and scenic easement requirements associated with the variances at 7981 Leah Circle. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Carter to continue the item to May 23rd and direct staff to prepare a resolution of approval for change of condition. Any further council discussion on this? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. No. No, no. Motion carries 5-2. Very good. Take care. Thank you. So, Mr. Husset, we'll see you back on the 23rd. Actually, you don't need to come back, I guess, but uh, you certainly could. So, it's a, it's a, thank good. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on to uh, item 4.3 on our agenda, and uh, actually 4.3 through 4.9, it becomes, uh, I believe, the Doug Junker show here as we get into this, as we uh, do some renewals of on and off sale liquor and wine license and so on. So. We'll start with item 4.3, Mr. Junker. Yes, Mr. Mayor and Council, as staff and I always have a joke about they're long-winded, and here I am with seven <laughs> items. So I don't know. Here we go. So, yeah, the first five are the, the annual liquor license renewals. Um, as we go through these, um, each one we're asking you to approve uh, pending the outstanding items, which is everything from maybe a missing form or a, a signature. Usually it's insurance. I'm always chasing insurance this time of year. So... Um, they're not always 100%. So, uh, but basically how this works is when I do have a complete packet, um, they're due to the state on June 1st. So that first mailing goes out and anything I'm still chasing through that month is just a potential delay and them getting deliveries July 1st. But uh, we're looking at uh, your approval on those with uh, those uh, general items still out there. There was a memo I sent you to. There is a couple um, holds. Um, uh, when we get to the wine license, Umbria um, did say they're not applying. And then uh, the Eagles did not apply for a renewal. Um, so that brings you down to just two clubs tonight. The Eagles will be coming back on June 6th with a full public liquor license. Um, June 6th, they'll be back with like five or six that night too. Um, so um, the um, what else did we have in there? Oh, we'll take it one at a time. So the first one's on sale. Um, this one went pretty smooth this year. Uh, I do, like I said, I do still have some outstanding items though. So um, looking for your approval with uh, with those outstanding items still uh, hanging. Thank you, Mr. Junker. Council, any questions tonight on the renewal of the on sale and Sunday on sale intoxicating liquor licenses as referenced in the packet? I don't see any questions. So this is a public hearing. I will open this public hearing at item 4.3. Is there anyone here in the chambers who wishes to speak to item 4.3? Nora, do we have anyone on the phone lines who wishes to speak to item 4.3? No one is on the yeah, phone line, sir. You may continue. Thank you, Nora. Council seeing no one coming forward, no one on the phone line, I would look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.3. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Coulter, second by Councilmember Lohman to close the public hearing on item 4.3. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0 with... Councilmember Nelson stepping away for a moment. Council, any questions on this? Any comments? Councilmember uh, Coulter. Uh, no comment other than it feels like every time we do this, I'm just reminded of the number of places in Bloomington that I haven't been to that I want to go to. So <laughs> just, you know, maybe I'll keep that in mind for the future. Keep this, uh, keep this handy. <laughs> um, I'm happy to make a motion. Councilmember there. Coulter. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. I will move to approve. <coughs> Excuse me. I will move to approve the on-sale and Sunday on-sale intoxicating liquor license renewals conditioned upon the submission of all general items. Second. Motion by Councilmember Coulter, second by Councilmember Lohman to approve of the on-sale and Sunday on-sale intoxicating liquor license renewals. Nope. Uh, Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I'll abstain since I was out of the room. Very good. Any further council discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0 with Councilmember Nelson abstaining. Item 4.4, a public hearing on the renewal of on-sale and Sunday on-sale club intoxicating liquor licenses. Yeah, Mr. Mayor and Council, as I mentioned, we kind of had a lot of moving targets this year during the renewal season. So um, this one, instead of the three items in front of you, we're looking for the approval of um, the on-sale um, uh, and Sunday on-sale club license for the Minnesota Valley Country Club and Everett McClay VFW. Thank you. Council, any questions of Mr. Junker? 
Hearing none, I will open this public hearing on item 4.4. This is a public hearing regarding the renewal of on sale and Sunday on sale club intoxicating liquor licenses. Anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak on this matter? <coughs> Nora, is there anyone on the phone who wishes to speak to item 4.4? No one is on the phone. Mr. Mayor, you may continue. Thank you, Nora. Council, nobody coming forward. No one wishes to speak on the phone. I'd look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.4. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Carter, second by Councilmember Lohman to close the public hearing on item 4.4. Hearing no further council discussion on this, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Councilmember Carter? All right, I would move to approve the on sale and Sunday on sale club intoxicating liquor license renewals conditioned upon the submission of all general items. Second. Motion by Councilmember Carter, second by Councilmember Lohman to approve the on sale and Sunday on sale club intoxicating liquor license renewals with the, uh, the changes stated by Mr. Junker uh, in his preface about uh, the, the, the two as opposed to the three that we have listed in the stack. Uh, yes, please. The, the packet. No further discussion on this, Council? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Item 4.5, a public hearing on the renewal of off-sale intoxicating liquor licenses. Mr. Junker. Mr. Mayor and Council, the off-sale license is pretty much pretty straightforward. So as presented, uh, um, with those general items still outstanding. Council, any questions? Seeing none, this is a public hearing. Item 4.5, on a renewal of the off-sale intoxicating liquor license. Anyone in the chamber is wishing to speak on this? Nora, is there anyone on the phone who wishes to speak to item 4.5? No one is on the phone, Mr. Mayor. You may continue. Thank you. Council, no one coming forward. I look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.5. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Lohman to close the public hearing on item 4.5. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Councilmember D'Alessandro. I would move uh, to approve the off-sale intoxicating liquor license renewals conditioned upon the submission of all general items. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Lohman, to approve the off-sale intoxicating liquor license renewals. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Item 4.6, public hearing on the renewal of on-sale wine licenses. Mr. Junker. Yeah, Mr. Mayor and Council, this is our on-sale wine licenses, and it does uh, have a very kind of a shorter list than the on sale but again uh, approved as presented except for international cafe incorporated doing business as umbria gourmet pizzeria have notified us that they are not pursuing a renewal very good thank you council any questions of mr junker seeing no questions this is a public hearing uh, item 4.6 on the renewal of on sale wine licenses anyone in the chambers wishing to speak on item 4.6 no one coming forward. Norwin, Nora, do we have anyone on the phone who wishes to speak to item 4.6? No one is on the phone, Mr. Mayor. You may continue. Thank you. Council, no one coming forward. I look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.6. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to close the public hearing. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries 6-0 with Councilmember Carter stepping away for a moment. Council, action on this. Uh, Councilmember Lohman. Mayor, I'll move to approve the on-sale wine license renewal conditions upon the submission of all general items and the uh, other items that uh, <coughs> Mr. Junker uh, mentioned. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to approve the on-sale wine license renewals with the uh, exception that Mr. Junker mentioned earlier. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Item 4.7, a public hearing on the renewal of brewer tap room on sale and small brewer on sale licenses. I can think of one. That's all you have. <laughs> Yes, Mayor and Council. Mr. Mr. Junker. <laughs> um, I see you. This is how you really wear a council out, isn't it? One at a time. Okay, so yeah, this is our first ever renewal of a brewery uh, and a tap room and off sale, uh, small off sale license. Uh, new to me, too. Um, and found some new paperwork I had to fill out. So, um, but our first ever renewal of our, our, our brew pub, our brew tap room, I should say. Tap room, very good. Council questions of Mr. Junker? <laughs> Councilmember D'Alessandro and then Councilmember Nelson. Just have one quick question. They've only been open since February. How, why did they have to have their license in place for so long? So, so 
um, Mr. Mayor and, and Councilmember Del Sandro, uh, liquor licenses by state statute are, have to be on a set schedule. So that's why we're here tonight with all of these all at once because we we are set for 6:30 on all our liquor and beer comes back at, at in December. So yeah, they may have just opened. They may just open a month ago, but it's time to renew it. The next two coming up, not to give away the ending tonight. The next two coming up. Are, are brand new licenses. The state does not accept any license more than 12 months. So you're approving this and renewing it all in one shot. More paperwork for me, easy for you. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we actually are sending in two forms of paperwork. Um, so the insurance, everything matches, but I have to do two forms. So, um, but yeah, we're on a set schedule. That's why that's why this happens. And just a quick follow-up, Mr. Mayor, did that mean that the license application that they had or anyone would have was prorated mm -hmm. for the period of time that it was in that period? Correct, okay. and that's also in statute and code, yeah. Yep. So, okay, mm -hmm. thank you very much, appreciate it. Councilmember Nelson? Yeah, thank you. I'm just wondering if we can condition this on their opening of the patio ASAP. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, As well as not holding events on Monday nights during council meetings. <laughs> Okay. Two solid suggestions. So, solid suggestions. Uh, well, Mr. Mayor and Council, yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just got the email from them today, and I did a drive-by. It's they're looking at Wednesday or Thursday. The patio's looking really good. So I went over and inspected that today to meet, make sure it meets our, our our licensing requirements. And they were working hard in this perfect weather for working on it. So yeah, it, it's it's a pretty sharp looking patio. So I heard I heard this week. Leave it to Mr. Junker to do his personal inspections. I appreciate that, Mr. Junker. Thank you so very much for that. Councilmember Coulter. Well, Mayor, you stole my joke. I was going to say, if you ever need any assistance inspecting <laughs> other patios around town, I am I am happy to step up in service of our community. Well, we'll do a field trip. No further questions of Mr. Junker. This is a public hearing. I will open the public hearing on item 4.7 for the renewal of Brewer Tap Room on sale and small brewer off sale licenses. Anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak on this? No one coming forward, nor do we have anyone on the phone who wishes to speak to item 4.7. No one is on the phone. Mr. Mayor, you may continue. Thank you. Council, nobody coming forward. I would look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.7. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Martin to close the public hearing on item 4.7. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Councilmember D'Alessandro. I'm always going to try to be first to get to renewing the folks at Nine Mile, I'll tell you that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so um, I move to approve the Brewer Tap Room on sale and small brewer off sale license renewals for Bloomington Brewery and Tap Room LLC doing business as Nine Mile Brewing Company, 9555 James Avenue South, Unit 270 in Bloomington, conditioned upon the submission of all general items. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Martin to approve the Brewer Tap Room on sale and small brewer off sale license renewals for Bloomington. Hearing no further council discussion on this, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Item 4.8, our next public hearing. This is for a new on sale intoxicating liquor license application for the Spring Hill Suites. Mr. Junker. Yes, Mr. Mayor and Council, Spring Hill Suites has been licensed with us for many years. Um, except for last year, they did not renew. And I think they were just coming out of that COVID wave and they didn't, they didn't bother. So then they've, they've come back now, getting ready for a new fresh start. So a uh, new license for an old licensee. So we're familiar with them and everything. It was, this was an easy one, so. Very good. Council, any questions of Mr. Junker on this one? No questions. I will open this public hearing on item 4.8. This is for a new on-sale intoxicating liquor license application for Spring Hill Suites. Anyone in the chambers wishing to speak on item 4.8? I see no one coming forward. Norwa Nora, is there anyone on the phone who wishes to speak to item 4.8? No, it's on the phone, Mr. Mayor. You may continue. Thank you, Nora. Council, nobody coming forward. I look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.8. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember Lohman to close the public hearing on item 4.8. No further council <coughs> discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries 7-0. Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor. I will move that we approve the on-sale intoxicating liquor license for ALM Bloomington LLC doing business at Spring Hill Suites. Second. Motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember Lohman to approve the on-sale intoxicating liquor license for ALM Bloomington doing business as Spring Hill Suites. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. And our final 
Hearing of the evening, item 4.9. A public hearing on a new on sale 3-2% malt beverage license application for El Fresco Restaurant. Yes, Mr. Mayor and Council. I'm amazed we're still doing this, but yes, a 3-2 beer license. <laughs> and before you ask, no, I have no information on how it's going at the state on this. So, um, But yeah, El Fresco is a, a restaurant in an office building, and they just want to add a beer to the menu. Um, long-standing restaurant with us, so 3-2 um, beer um, on sale for El, El Fresco. And we are the only state in the union, correct? Yes, we are. Interesting. It's not really interesting, but it's interesting. <laughs> Council, any additional questions of Mr. Junker on this? I will open the public hearing at item 4.9, a new on-sale 3 2 Malt beverage license for El Fresco restaurant. Anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak to item 4.9? No one coming forward. Nora, do you have anyone on the phone who wishes to speak to item 4.9? No one is on the phone. Mr. Mayor, you may proceed. Thank you, council. Nobody coming forward. I look for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Motion by council member Martin, second by council member Loman to close the public hearing on item 4.9. No further questions or comments by the council. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? <laughs> Motion carries 7-0. Council Member Martin, bring us on home here. Thank you, Mayor. I will move that we approve the on-sale 3-2% malt uh, beverage license for El Fresco Restaurant, LLC. Second. Motion by Council Member Martin, second by Council Member uh, Coulter, to approve the th on-sale 3-2 malt beverage license for El Fresco Restaurant, LLC. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you very much, Mr. Junker. Thank you very much. Nora, thank you very much. Our public comment opportunities for this evening have uh, completed, have ended, so you may take the rest of the night off. Thank you much for your work tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, you too. Thank you. Move on to item five on our agenda, our organizational business, and an item that we continued from last time, a budget update and discussion for our 2023 budget. Uh, I believe we've got uh, a double header here. One, Yuli Seal, our fire chief, and Kari Carlson, our budget manager, who is, I believe, remote this evening. So we will start with uh, our fire chief, Chief Seal. Good evening, okay. sir. Matt, and bring up the presentation. Mr. Mayor, council members, I'm here to brief you on um, issues specifically regarding staffing for the fire department. You can click the next slide. So tonight's presentation, there are five sections to it, and I'll go through each section um, um, and give you a little briefing. Some of it's historical in the sense of how we got to where we are today, um, and some of it is where we are at today and where we want to go in the future. So next slide. We, in 19, uh, excuse me, 2019, we um, asked for and um, received a, a review of fire services. And this is part of the program that the city council had adopted to have all city departments have their service services reviewed and make a determination on whether we were doing the right what and um, or if we could do some improvements somehow. And as a result of this fire service review, um, there was several recommendations made by the uh, consultant. Um, and if you recall, this, this report to council was delayed a little bit because of the onset of the pandemic, and, and so it was done virtually, but um, um, the council at the time was given the report, and we went through the recommendations, so I'll just kind of go over them very quickly again. Um, recommendation one, next slide. Recommendation one was to adopt updated deployment policies and a response time standard. And, and we had some um, um, response time standards, but they weren't um, state, of the, um, state of the art in the sense of they weren't what was normally accepted across the country um, and um, weren't allowing um, the city or the city council to actual monitor actual performance. And so the, the consultant's recommendation was to adopt updated complete performance measures to aid deployment planning and to monitor performance of the department. And if you recall at the time the report was given, the council gave me direction to come back with some updated 
um, updated standards. Um, um, and I'll get back to that a little bit. The measures of time that they wanted um, us to adopt should be designed to deliver outcomes that will save patients or, or people when possible and keep small fires, small but serious fires, small. Um, so, and that really revolves around response time, um, as we've spoken about before. The next recommendation was on the distribution of fire stations, and, and the distribution of fire stations is tied directly to response time. And their uh, recommendation was to be able to um, respond and have an effective response force, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, um, respond, an initial um, unit, um, respond within seven and a half minutes from the time the 911 call comes into dispatch. So someone calls 911, and seven and a half minutes later, you have that initial um, fire unit arriving with three, person, three or four personnel on it. Um, so and if you want that split out, it's a 90-second dispatch time, two-minute uh, company turnout time from the station, and, and a uh, uh, four-minute travel time to get to that seven and a half minutes. Then the next recommendation was about multiple unit um, effective response force for serious emergencies, and this is what we call a multi-station response. So for a structure fire, for a hazmat emergency, for a technical rescue, for a vehicle extrication with uh, victims trapped, we get multiple stations on those. And their recommendation was to adopt a response time standard of 11 and a half minutes um, from 911 call to the time the entire effective response force got to the scene. Um, the, the next one was for hazardous materials response. Um, and the um, hazardous materials response and technical rescue both um, were recommending an initial response of seven and a half minutes and an extended response or a multiple ERF response of 11 and a half minutes. It's very similar to uh, a structure fire or a serious incident. Um, and the last recommendation was around the fire stations and based upon fire station locations, um, they recommend the stations be in their current locations or very close to them and that the city continue to uh, update and upgrade those structures, um, specifically the four that were um, in, in need of updating and adding 24-hour um, capability to Fire Station 1. Next slide. The recommendations that we have completed, and I want to be careful about using the word completed with the duty crew recommendation, but the recommendation was to maintain duty crews, which we have done, um, and continue with our paid on coal program, which we have done. Um, um, but we are struggling with that, which is the reason for the rest of the presentation. Um, the chief officers, he also recommended adding chief officers. We have done that. Um, and I'll mention some um, um, situations um, in a few minutes where adding those chief officers have been really critical to our success. Um, reducing ladder trucks. We had six ladder trucks, and ladder trucks are very expensive. Um, in fact, you will probably be approving purchase of a ladder truck for next year in June here. Um, um, so they're very expensive, and his recommendation was is that we could um, institute two um, lesser kinds of apparatus, what we call rescues or heavy rescues, that carry all the tools and equipment of a ladder truck and perform, perform all the functions of a ladder truck with the exception of the aerial device. Maintain three um, aerials in the city and add two um, heavy rescues. One which we've already done, um, and that's why it's under the success. We did not replace one tractor uh, one, one aerial device already, and in, in, in its place we have placed a, a heavy rescue. The next one that was due to be replaced is due to be replaced in 2025, and we won't replace that one with a ladder. We'll actually replace that with a heavy rescue at probably less than half the cost. Next slide. Going on to effective response for, or force and fire department staffing. Next slide. So when we talk about an effective response force, there's two layers to that. One is for that initial unit that's responding, and we talk about three or four firefighters on that. And then there's another effective response force when we talk about multiple, um, uh, multiple stations or multiple units responding. And we have generally focused our standard around 15, uh, 15 firefighters, getting 15 firefighters on the fire ground in a certain amount of time. 
Um, their recommendation is 11 and a half minutes, but they also wanted to point out to us that 15 firefighters is adequate for a single family, um, small to medium sized residential dwelling. It's not adequate for apartment buildings, high rises or commercial buildings, which as you all know, um, um, occupy a fair amount of real estate in the city. Um, so I just wanted to point that out as we move forward, as we continue to talk about staffing issues. So fire department staffing, uh, staffing, our adequate staffing continues to be a critical issue. Um, 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 years ago, our, I had come to council um, quite a few years ago. I don't want to date myself too terribly in front of you guys tonight, but um, we had set a, 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 a kind of a good number for the fire department to be staffed at with paid on-call firefighters of 155. And I'd given an authorized, at that point in time, I'd been given an authorized number of 175 to maintain that 155. So in other words, you'd be able to hire over 155 in anticipation of, of retirements. The last time we were even close to that number was in 2002. Um, we've struggled mightily for many years. Um, for multiple reasons, um, um, as, we, as we come through, um, but to give you a sense of where we're at, currently we're, we're currently at about 91 active firefighters with our seven uh, chiefs that gets us to 98. Um, so we're missing more than a third of our workforce if I was using 2002, uh, 2002 data or standards. Um, and as you look at the uh, call response and how that's affected been affected in 2015, and, and um, um, there was a request for some historical data uh, the last time I was here, um, and they wanted to talk about 2002, and we were close to um, um, 150, um, but um, I, I, uh, I could not unearth those records. <laughs> in an archeological dig in our data systems. So I went back to where I could easily grab some data. And in 2015, um, we, um, and I actually started tracking these numbers in 2007. But in 2015, a unit or a truck uh, rolled staffed with only two people about 222 times in 2015, uh, which I at the time thought was, you know, not a, bad, not a good thing, was, was terrible. Um, and in 2015, a unit failed to respond or did not respond. They were unable to respond due to a lack of staff 52 times. And then you look in 2021, and you can see the number difference. A lot of this has to do with an increase of runs, but it also has to do with a real increase in the number of times that we have trucks rolling with two or one personnel and um, in many cases not being able to roll because uh, we don't have enough staff. Next slide. So the examples we can use for three working fires in March, um, trying to get 15 people on the fire ground in 11 and a half minutes. Um, I only made it on one of those three working fires, which is about what we average about a third of the time we make that. Um, and that was due to the fact that we had trucks on the road um, and responding already out responding. Something similar happened Friday night. We had a structure, uh, structure fire Friday night. We had some trucks on the road already. We made our 11 and a half minutes, but I had uh, one engine that rolled with one, one engine that rolled with two, one rescue that rolled with two um, uh, on uh, one ladder that while it rolled with four, it had two brand new people. The one engine that rolled with two had a brand new person. Uh, the one engine that rolled with one had a brand new person. Um, so those chiefs that I was talking to you about, I was plugging in to crews with new people um, so we could uh, complete our operation. Yeah. And it went well, um, but I'm always concerned about um, living on borrowed time with, with my staffing issues. Next slide. Just wanted to bring up and show you quickly the firefighter training requirements. I know, you're on your time delay. <laughs> There we go. Um, just to talk to you about uh, uh, training requirements, one of the things we found as we recruit nowadays, it's been much more difficult to get people to, uh, <coughs> to, uh, 
to uh, sign up for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons that's been made to clear to us is the time commitment. And tremendous amount of initial training time requirement, uh, requirements in the first year and a half. Next slide. And then the ongoing training requirements as well um, go on annually for all of our firefighters. So there's a considerable amount of training um, involved as well as a considerable amount uh, of time devoted to actual response. Next slide. So our staffing performance, so our goal, and the goal I wanted to come back to you and have you adopt, but I've hesitated to do that because we are, as you can see by the numbers, quite a ways off from the goal. It's three firefighters on scene within seven minutes and 30 seconds. And in 2018 and 19, we're, um, and that's within 90% of the time. Um, originally, we were doing averages, but if you, understand math at all, you understand that when you do an average, there's at least half of, of the, 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 uh, the things you're trying to measure that don't even meet the average. And um, that's significant when you're talking about emergency response. So the, the national um, um, standard or the national standards out there and the, and the movement nationally for the fire service is that they use a 90% standard, 90% fractal me measurement to be exact. And in, and in 2018 and 2019, you got ahead of me a little bit there, um, that, that was nine minutes and 17 seconds. And then 2021 and 2022, this is for our first unit on scene um, with a minimum of three people. Um, it was 11 minutes and 30 seconds. So we've gotten worse, which is to be expected. I've dropped more people. Um, and um, things have can become uh, more challenging. Um, for our structure fire goal, that 15 firefighters on the scene in 11 minutes and 30 seconds, 90% of the time, our actual performance is about 27% of the time, about a third of the time. Now, I will tell you that we go to all structure fires and we've um, 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 extinguished them all, right? There's, um, I've had a very good, got a very good friend that tells me all fires go out, all bleeding stops whether we intervene or not. But we want to intervene in a positive sense, right, and end those things much more quickly. So um, um, about a third of the time we're meeting our standard with that. But the, each one gets a response um, and action. This is not just happening in Bloomington. This is a nationwide problem. Um, it's happened in the metro area. A number of our surrounding departments have had significant changes in how they staff and how they have to staff their fire services um, to meet, uh, to meet uh, the needs of their communities. And these are just some, some of the ones that listed. Um, some of uh, the requests the last time um, were about a little more defined metrics from those surrounding communities, and it's pretty tough to pry that out of people because... Um, I'm asking them to do a lot of homework um, for uh, not much return. So um, I was able to, like I say, list the ones that have changed um, from, um, if you look at the neighboring combination departments, Eden Prairie, Invergrove Heights, Apple Valley, Savage, Shakopee, Minnetonka, they've all changed from paid on call operations just like ours to combination departments, which is what we're proposing to continue to move to. I would consider us that now, but... Um, increasing. Next slide. So our staffing plan. Uh, council had asked, what's the plan? Where are we going forward with this? What, what, what's, wh how are we going to solve this problem? So what I'd like to do this year um, now is add four full-time firefighter fire inspectors. And this does a couple of things for us. It helps us uh, address our daytime day duty crew um, shortages. Um, we have not been able in the daytime been able to staff all of our duty crew engines that we try to staff um, recently. Staffing has gotten more difficult, and uh, as my command staff always points out to me, um, we ain't even in the summer yet. Um, so um, I would like to add four off an existing list, um, and um, this would also assist us in addressing our current fire code inspection backlog. Um, this was something we were struggling to keep up with pre-COVID, and then when COVID came, things obviously got a lot worse. So, 
So we're trying to catch up on that. We'd be using existing dollars within our budget to do this, and it is already an existing um, um, position that exists in the city pay plan. So there's really no change that needs to be done. I just wanted to let you know this is what, what we want to do moving forward. Next slide. Long term, more longer term, um, is to create that hybrid model, um, more, more um, career in our combination model. We considered combination now because we have some career and primarily uh, paid on call. We want to add some more career to that. Um, looking to hire six firefighters uh, a year over the next 10 years to try to get to that 75 full-time and maintain 60 paid on call firefighters. Um, using um, our current roster and new recruits to, to, do, to do this. So our current roster of paid on-call firefighters would stay, and um, we'd add new paid on-call firefighters as well um, to, to try to maintain that roster. Next slide. This is, uh, um, this is um, the money slide. Um, this is why I'm speaking with Kari tonight, because um, all these decisions have budget implications, as you are well aware. Um, so in 2023, to add six, um, and then adding six in 24 and in 25, you can see that implication to the uh, budget moving forward. We um, tried to do the escalator, um, kind of predicting out where um, um, salary, wages, and benefits would go for 24 and 25. Um, 23, we had a pretty good, uh, pretty good idea about it. Um, as we add people, career people, uh, we need to add a, uh, 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 another layer of management, basically what they are as a crew boss or a captain on a rig um, that manages and runs that crew. Um, and we would use existing career people that we'd hire, and, and that would be a pay differential that we'd have to do on those, on those trucks that we staffed. Next slide. Now, as you well know, we did apply for a SAFER grant, that's Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response, and that, if we're successful, would provide funding for three years, salary and benefits for three years for 18 full-time firefighters, 23 through 25. Um, we are kind of doubling up on this um, um, for two reasons. One is, is that we probably won't hear about a SAFER award until the fall after you guys already set the preliminary levy and we'll have already had budget discussions. So we had to go ahead and plan moving forward on how to, how to um, add some people. Um, and the other reason would be um, it also gives us an opportunity um, to look at our, our situation moving forward and, and maybe front end load what we're trying to do um, to get to that 60. Um, but, like I said, these are all council decisions that have yet to be made. This is, a, uh, um, this is kind of a briefing to answer the questions that you'd asked me the last time I stood in front of you and give you an opportunity to ask me some more. That was a period. I, wasn't, I thought there was another. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Um, Longer term budget, how does this relate to uh, a pension and the, 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 the pensions issues that we've been having over the past few years where the city con contributions to uh, the firefighters pension plan? So obviously you have fewer people in the pension plan, your contributions would go down. We're actually going to be working with um, our actuarial um, whether it's Milliman or not, I'm not sure yet, but whether we're going to be working with an actuarial to try to make a determination on what that exact impact would be. Okay, thank you. Council, additional questions here? Council Member Lohman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to say off the bat, I appreciate you looking at the different departments. I know that was an impossible ask, but <laughs> just in case something came through, <laughs> I do appreciate you doing that. Um, so I, I see that every, uh, every year we try to add six but I wasn't clear to me how we'd get to the 75. Is it that we already? We already got some. Okay. So six a year for 10 years is 60, and then I've already got, um, with you to count the uh, seven chiefs, the four existing fire, fighter fire inspectors I have, plus an additional four. Okay. Eight and seven is. Yeah, that adds up. That works. So then how, 
would we handle attrition with that you know, over the, I mean, cause obviously it, we're not going to just maintain six all the time. I know with the 151, it was, you know, we went to one, 175. How would that be handled and what would be the impact? That would be handled slightly differently than I was trying to do with paid on call is we'd be filling open positions. So as attrition happens, we'd fill open positions. And it'd have the same impact from a budgetary standpoint? Right. You wouldn't be adding more career positions in anticipation of retirements. You'd fill vacancies as they'd occurred. I'd become more of a regular customer for HR. That's funny. Councilmember Coulter and then Councilmember Martin. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm curious about these firefighters slash inspectors. How do they divide their time? Are they on call one day and then the next day they're inspecting or are they just always kind of inspecting and then, oh, I got to go take a call? Or how does that work? Well, this is new, all right, and I'm doing, um, I, I won't say I'm thinking out of the box, but I'm really scrambling trying to find people to, uh, to ride trucks um, and get the trucks out the door. But I also need um, people to do inspections. So right now I've got four inspectors that I keep robbing to get trucks out the door, um, and I keep putting chiefs on trucks to get trucks out the door. Um, so adding four will uh, allow me at least to, and rotate them then, so I have some filling trucks and some inspecting every day, where some days right now I don't have anybody inspecting because I'm trying to keep, keep trucks in service. Gotcha. Thank you. Councilmember Member Martin. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief. I, I guess in general, moving forward, obviously we've got some huge developments coming up in front of us, be it one of the world's biggest water parks, some huge amount of development around potentially a World's Fair. With that ideal number of active folks around 155, I guess how, what are we taking into account for the projections of large commercial structures or the development in South Loop or kind of wiggle room? What does that look like? So that 155 is a 2002 number. Okay. The number moving forward in the long-term plan, if um, we actualize it, would be um, the 75 career and 60, um, um, 60 paid on call. Okay. Um, so that would be the total, which is somewhat less than 155. Um, we think um, that we will be able to staff all six stations with that. 24 hours a day, okay. um, which will give us a much better, uh, quicker response um, than we have right now. Right now, we build into our response time about four minutes that it takes our firefighters to get to the stations and get trucks out. Okay. Um, so that's why that seven and a half minutes is really difficult to, to meet. Um, so wait, and quick follow-up on that, if you don't mind. Uh, so then with that 135, should we anticipate that if we see a high volume of high-rise commercial development, we should be reevaluating this number then a few years in or once those developments materialize? Um, I hesitate to make a promise for a future chief. Um, I would tell you right now we've got 40 or 50 high-rise buildings in the city, um, the Mall of America, um, some extremely large 400-plus uh, unit apartment buildings, um, I would be much better situated with that 135 than I am right now with 91. That makes sense. Thank you, Chief. Council, additional questions? Council Member Nelson. Yeah. Um, thank you, Chief, for the information. I know we've been talking about this for a while, and I am just wondering what it would look like to accelerate this plan. I mean, the information you've provided showing that we're not meeting current standards and then our plan is to uh, you know, maybe put, give you the staffing that you need within a decade. Uh, it makes me feel a little uncomfortable, and and so uh, you know, my I'm just wondering what that would look like and how we might accelerate that more. Um, that's a tremendous amount of people to bring on a big change in that uh, process. And then I, I do have one other question after that. So we have actually talked about that with Assistant City Manager Mike Sable um, and about the potential to accelerate, and that gets back to my comment that if we get the SAFER grant, and we've already got six in the budget for next year, that if, if, if that was possible to try to start front-end loading this process, 
Um, if we don't get the safer grant, you know, we only have six in the budget for next year and we could look at doing something more for the year after, but all of that has budget implications. And that was the reason for the budget slide showing you that we're talking about um, each one of those six personnel acquisitions is about 1% on the levy. No, I appreciate that, Chief. And, and I can just tell you, I can only speak for myself here, but it's, it's a budget item that is easily defensible to the community. And um, so, especially given the information that you provided. My second question, I know, I think, I believe you've answered this before, I've asked it before, but the new buildings are all designed for this model that the 24 hour people could be staying there um, and be able to respond quickly. That's, that's correct. Okay, that's what I thought. And so. just, just to reiterate, we needed that before anyway, because we were asking people to come down and and spend nights for blizzards or severe weather or when the storms come through or or for uh, um, other events that have happened whether it was the rnc or whatever and when we do that they were sleeping on cots out on the apparatus floor so okay less than ideal so <laughs> i will just uh, anecdotally tell you i my business office is across the street from fire station one in burnsville their new fire station. Got That's a nice place. Chief Young Men, very nice uh, facility there. And um, one of the things that they did with their council and their mayor is they took them through the training. They did a day long thing with them. And, and um, I don't know exactly what they did, but I assume if Mayor Coutts could do it, I'm sure Mayor Boosie could do it. So, <laughs> so would love at some point to for the vote of confidence there. <laughs> so, we, we'd be happy to give each and every one of you the opportunity if you desired to uh, um, put some gear on and see what it's like to to uh, to do what we do um, you know day like today would have been really nice but I think we should probably wait till some kind of a steamy July or August day <laughs> to give you a good sense of what actually happens when you put that gear on you sound like my father <laughs> <laughs> councilmember Carter Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I will take you up on that offer. Okay. That. Maybe not. I mean, I would like to avoid <laughs> July, but whatever you whatever you say, I'll do. Um, so, you know, I echo, echo Councilmember Nelson's comments around um, making sure that I think it's high priority for us to meet the the need in our community, and and I believe that residents would really be behind those decisions. Uh, but I I do have a question. I know obviously we we applied to the or for the safer grant. But are there other funding sources that we can be looking at? I, I'm just thinking about the Department of Public Safety. Um, Most I, I know, SAFER is unique in the sense that it is really set up to fund positions um, for fire departments. Mm -hmm. um, there are other grant opportunities, but they're usually for equipment and or training. Um, they don't um, focus specifically on replacing uh, salaries and benefits. And then the SAFER grant has, has changed as well. Last year and this, uh, this year, the last application and this application, both were unusual in the sense that they were paying um, all of the salary and benefits for three years. In years past, it's been graduated where they paid 80% the first year, 50% the, 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 uh, the second year, and 25% the third year. So it was graduated down where this, these two grant periods Primarily due to COVID and the stress on the system, they were replacing um, the full three years of benefits and salaries. Got it. Got it. Well, thank you. And thank you for your ongoing leadership. Thank Much you. appreciated. Now, is the, the, the SAFER grant, is that through, that's through FEMA? Is that correct? Yeah, it's through the um, um, United States Fire Administration, okay. National Fire Academy, et cetera, et cetera. And is it a, is it a yearly or a rolling program, or is there... You know, does it sunset in, in a certain time? Um, it is annual based upon what Congress appropriates to fund the program. Got it. <laughs> okay. So I would like to say it's annual, but it's annual, but. Based on, yes. Yeah. Understood. Councilmember Don Alessandro. Thank you, Mayor. Hi, Chief. Hi. Um, have we ever received that grant before? We have not. We only applied for it. Um, last this last year and for for the one this year we've only applied for it these two times okay thank you just for everyone's information a quick review here i'm seeing all of two cities in the state of minnesota 
who received funding last year. That's correct. Yep. Inver Grove Heights and Brooklyn Park. Um, Brooklyn Park had received one in the past, so that was this is their second one. And Inver Grove Heights, I think this is the first time they'd applied. Very good. So, and uh, we'll know about those later in the in the fall, whether or not we're successful with that grant application? They start awarding in July. Oh, okay. So we could hear soon, or as it happened the last time, it was like October before they notified us. Right. Council, additional questions? Uh, well, I concur with all that's been said, that I uh, appreciate the work that you have put into this, and I know the hours that you've sat and worried about this, and the sleepless nights you've thought about all this, and the planning that has gone into this. And um, I, I think, yes, this is this is an, an, a need. This is an urgent need within the city of Bloomington that is probably 15 or 20 years behind schedule right now. And so uh, I'm happy that we, we can take the lead on this and happy that you are pushing this through and, and calling us on this and, and pushing us through on this because it absolutely has to happen and I appreciate your your leadership on that. Thank you. All right. If any of you think of something or have questions, do not hesitate to reach out to me. Um, this is something I'm pretty well versed in and I think Kari's up next. Did you have something else? Councilmember Carter? Thank you, Mayor. I guess I did have one qu quick question and this may be a better question after Kari is done, but uh, I guess I'm curious if you've thought through like the public engagement strategy around this issue specifically. And I'm just thinking more around raising awareness and communicating, making sure that residents understand uh, that this is a huge, huge, I would, I don't want to use the word crisis, but like, I mean, it's a big deal, right? And we have to figure out a solution. And so <coughs> I guess I'm just wondering if you've thought about those compo components or worked with co-ed to kind of think through how we can engage the community around this issue. Been doing that for a number of years. Probably um, probably to the point where I've numbed some people or actually uh, developed some, um, some uh, resistance out there. Mm, okay, okay. <laughs> Sometimes surprises work better, I don't know. But uh, so you, you, I think most people will be in favor, but do not be surprised when some people speak out against it. As you guys well know, there is no single subject that everybody can agree on anymore. Oh, yeah, we know. <laughs> All right, All right, thank you. I'll leave it to Kari, Kari then. Thank you, Chief. Uh, and yes, Council Member, that's, well, tune into the Council Minute this week because this will be the topic of discussion, and I think it's incumbent on all of us to start talking about some of these things as well and start normalizing this conversation because it's an important one, and it's, uh, there's, there's ramification. It's a big number, and it's going to be important that we have people understand uh, the importance of this and the urgency of it. So, Good evening, Ms. Carlson. Welcome. Hello, Mayor and Council. Thanks for uh, joining us. I know, uh, I believe you're you're at a conference this, this week, are you not? I am. I am at a Tyler Muniz Financial Payroll HR Software Conference in Indianapolis. Wow, sounds like a rocking good time. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's been very good. Uh, a lot of good classes today, learned a lot of information to be more efficient in the software, learn new functionality, uh, learn things from other people from all over the country. So Great, great. Well, yeah. I uh, apologize for putting you off until this week. I know that uh, it would have been probably better in your schedule for, to do this presentation last week, so I appreciate your flexibility with this and uh, looking forward to the discussion. So please go on ahead. All right. I'm going to bring up my presentation. Okay, so um, so just first of all, uh, just want to thank you, uh, or want to thank Fire Chief Yuli Seal for presenting the Fire Department um, long-term staffing plan. And um, as you said, it's a critical issue and will have a big impact on uh, the budget. So, so tonight I have um, some additional information to share with you, as well as some discussion items. So the topics include. Um, uh, we're going to just go through how we're going to inc incorporate the new Bloomington Tomorrow Together strategic plan into the 2023 budget request. And then I'm going to talk about property tax and market value uh, changes. I'm going to just go over some preliminary 
revenue projections, and then a discussion on what you would like to for us to share at these public um, engagement events I'm going to be doing around the budget, which Councilmember Carter just brought up. So I think um, there might be some ideas already. Um, and then just quickly, I'm going to highlight some dates, um, some budget dates in the calendar. So wanted to make sure you were aware and that you know that the focus this year is to align our 2023 budget request with the city's new mission and our values that were adopted in the new Bloomington Tomorrow Together strategic plan. So our mission is to cultivate an enduring and remarkable community where people want to be. And I am not going to uh, read through all of these, but I do have in just here just to to put up here that as we're going through the budget requests, we're going to be looking at the strategic objectives that we've set um, to achieve by 2030, and that we're also going to um, be looking at the strategies that were identified in our new strategic plan. Um, I mean, we want to build trusting relationships that acknowledge diversity, ensure the community can understand support and actively contribute and align efforts across organizations in the community so we can maximize our assets. And then um, our core values, we wanna make sure those are also um, reflected in this budget. And um, so I won't, I won't read through all these again, but I'm just wanna put them here that this is gonna be a big focus on this year's budget request and our future budget requests. So, while we are reviewing the budget requests, we're going to be um, making sure that we're not adding a program, project, policy, or service that does not consistent with our core values and align to our mission, and that we're not going to allow past practices to interfere with the consideration of new ideas. Also, there will be a focus on aligning and prioritizing the work that we are already doing with the new BTT plan. So that means an assessment will be done of current initiatives that already fit into the new BTT framework. And then a gap analysis will be done on anything that needs to be added and additional resources that may be needed in the 2023 budget request. And so we will make sure to highlight those um, to the council as we're presenting budget information. And then um, Next section. So um, just to highlight, this is the 2022 property tax levy that was set. It was $68.3 million and a majority 75% funds uh, police, public works and fire. And then about 9% of that tax levy funds debt service, which that's principal and interest payments for debt that's issued to fund large capital improvements for facilities, uh, roads, and parks. So the information that's on this slide, um, you've seen some of this before. This is just highlighting from the city assessor's presentation from a few weeks ago. So this year there have been large increases in value across all property segments. And Matt Gershmill, also the city assessor, um, made this point. I want to make this point again, that, that, that this does not mean that property taxes are going to increase by these large percentages that are shown on this graph. Um, the total property, the property tax is a total dollar amount that the council sets. It's the annual levy, property tax levy, and that is allocated among properties based on their value and type of property. So um, the city can't bring in more taxes than the total dollar amount that's levied. So the market valuations don't determine how much property tax comes in. It determines uh, what portion of the overall levy a certain property taxpayer will pay. And so Minnesota property tax calculations are very complex, as you know, but, um, but overall properties that have higher values pay a higher portion of this overall tax levy. And then just another um, highlight, this again was presented from uh, the city assessor, Matt Gershmel, but um, 
during his presentation about the annual assessment report, he showed this slide where it has the single family uh, residential home in Bloomington and how it has increased over the last five years by 44.4%. .4%. So in 2017, the median value home in Bloomington was $246,400. Now in 2022, that is $355,900. So we're, we're looking at um, prop, potential property tax overall levy increases um, and, and how that might affect the median value home here. Um, the median value home, so right now in 2022, that has a city property tax amount that's um, a little over $101 a month. And so below here is this um, what the potential impact could be. So if the property, the overall property tax amount was not increased at all, that would, um, with, with the valuation changes, it would go up slightly, so about 1%. So um, that would be an increase of $1.05 per month. Um, as you, if you call from last year, that's very different from um, last year when even without any increases to the um, the property tax levy, the uh, median value home was looking at an increase of like eight percent, and that had to do with how the valuations were shifted, and how commercial was up. I'm sorry, commercial was down, but residential was up. So this year, it's it's um, that's not the case, but you can see, um, you know, zero percent. 2%, 4%, 6%. This is an increase in the overall tax levy. In, um, in the second column there, I have the dollar amount that that would equate to. So a 2% overall increase in the property tax levy would equal $1.3 million. A 6% increase would equal uh, four, over $4 million. And then you can see how that equates to a increase per month for um, city property taxes. Um, next, I would just like to go over some of our very preliminary uh, revenue projections for um, the 2023 budget, 2024 conceptual budget. So property taxes are the largest revenue source in the city's general fund. And then the second largest revenue source comes from local lodging and admission taxes. And as you know, in 2020, those plummeted um, they went from $10.4 million down to $3.2 million due to the impacts of the pandemic. And in 2021, the revenues, um, they improved. They were at $6.3 million and they were better than what we had budgeted. Um, and then staff from community development and from finance, we've been meeting regular, regularly since uh, March, 2020, um, just to analyze hotel industry, research and trends and just based on our analysis um, it's still looking that gradually they will come back up to those pre-pandemic levels in 2025 but you can see the drastic um, drop that they made in 2020 and then they're still not back to where they were and then um, I'm also just wanted to show another significant revenue source in the general fund. Um, so it's property taxes, the local uh, lodging and admission tax, and then permit revenue. So this is um, permanent revenue, permit revenues from uh, building, electrical, HVAC, uh, plumbing permits. The total revenues, uh, they were down in 2021 um, compared to 2020. And they are expected to to be down a little bit this year as well. For 23 and 24, the uh, building and inspection staff, they are cons at, the, at the moment right now from the information they have, they're conservatively projecting them to come up um, slightly in 23 and 24, but not you know huge increases. So that brings us to um, our public engagement events that we have planned. So this is a screenshot from the, the, the budget page on the city's website. And these are events that I have planned. 
um, for um, for this year. And so my first public budget engagement event will be this Saturday, May 21st. So coming up really soon at the police open house and I will be at a table um, also with the police department accountant, Abdi Awajama. So we'll both be there and we're gonna be handing out information answering questions. We're going to be providing a QR code link that's going to go right to our budget um, page on the city's website. That'll have more information and we'll also have links to um, answer questions that we're going to ask um, that'll link to Let's Talk Bloomington and also get ideas and feedback from the public. And, um, and so, uh, go to this next slide here. Um, just wanted to show you, this is what we had last year. And so these were the questions. So at um, the public engagement events that we had, also what we had on Let's Talk Bloomington, we gathered this information and shared this um, with you as you were um, making uh, decisions about the budget. So we, only, we had three questions last year. It was, what is your favorite city service? What service or area would you like to see more investment in? and why, and then what advice do you have for the city council as they set the final uh, 22 budget and tax levy? And then we shared that um, information with you um, last year. I think I also we also put that in a one weekly recently so you can see all the responses that we had. And then, um, oops, I went too far. So that brings um, me to, we do have some ideas, um, staff has some ideas of things that we'd like to share um, at these public engagement sessions and questions to ask. But before these get started, we just wanna hear from you, what you wanna make sure that we, that we find out from the public, that we bring back to you, and what information do you think is very important that we share with them. So that's the end of my presentation. And then I just wanted to hear from you what you would, want to make sure that I communicate at these public engagement events and um, also what, what you want to know from them. Thank you. Once again, good information. It is just stunning to see that the cliff that the, uh, the uh, revenue fell off for the, 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 uh, um, the budget, the, uh, the hospitality budgets just fell right off the table. It's just amazing to see that, that crater. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Mr. Mayor, I have actually just a quick question, if I could, uh, um, about the bu budget um, presentation. <clears throat> Hi, Kari, nice to see you. And thanks for accommodating us during your travels. Um, I just had a quick question. The, the, the debt service number that you uh, shared with us, if you want to go back to that slide, um, I, I just... Historically, is that about the been about the same for us, and or is it higher or lower than I don't know historically typical? And also, um, is it is it historically or typical for a city our size? Depending upon, I guess, what you're doing, of course. But I'm just kind of curious how it lines up with uh, with what your standards are, or what you're looking at in terms of um, comps. Is uh, is Lori in the in the council chambers <laughs> this evening? <laughs> I don't know. If, Sorry, um, put you on the spot. I might defer. I might defer to Lori on that question. I I mean, um, my first response. I think it has been uh, gr growing. I can see her coming up there. Mayor and Councilmember Lissandro, I would say that the debt amount is growing. Um, what we have done for a number of years is not invest in several of our facilities and that is coming and those debt numbers are, um, we'll probably come back with you um, prior to the preliminary levy setting and walk you through just uh, where our um, CIP document um, is at and what that debt would look like. Um, and, and it might depend on what legislation passes next week or not, um, sure. where we would model different numbers. Sure. Um, quick follow-up question to that. I, uh, the, I guess the, the, I'm assuming that there's a, a minimum or a maximum, like there's some, there's some uh, 
being that you're the conservative individual that you are, I, I assume that there's a there's a, a point after which you would not be recommending certain things. And I'm just kind of curious if you know what that number is, or if there's a if there's general rule um, or a um, some requirement we have around our AAA bond rating or anything like that that determines the the amount of debt service we would want to carry. Mayor and Councilmember Delisandro, I would say um, a lot of the debt pieces, again, um, could be the appetite for council to raise the tax levy. Um, for example, when we look at the fire station bonds that we just issued, that debt service on that is just under $900,000 a year. So just for that facility for the 20 years that that feels you know, we're going to climb that one and a quarter percent up in tax levy for that piece. And then as we add new facilities, that will increase our debt service. Um, I would like to keep our debt service in general. Um, you know, when we look at that percentage there, um, you know, in the 15 to 16 percent of the total amount. Um, but that's conservative. But again, we have a lot of needs that have built up over time, and um, it will be the appetite for the council and the residents to absorb that. And we can stagger and pull them out, but sometimes the roof will leak. <laughs> um, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see Mr. Verbrugge has joined us. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council members. Good evening. Uh, to add to what Lori said and, and uh, also to answer the question from Council Member D'Alessandro, uh, when, when we go through a, a bond rating review, that's one of the factors that the, the rating agency will look at. And uh, to date, they have never commented about uh, concern of the, the debt service load uh, that we maintain. Uh, and Lori stated accurately is that uh, where we're at is uh, is not in an area where you would be concerned as a percentage of the of the total levy or the city's total fiscal capacity. So uh, there certainly is room uh, to add debt as the council prioritizes various uh, capital improvements, uh, and that's always going to be just a balancing act between what the needs are and and what the impact is to the property taxpayers. But to be very specific about your question, council member. Um, the the nine percent figure is is not out of line at all. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, Kari, the questions you asked, um, what do we think we should you should highlight as your your tabling opportunities? I think well, the discussion we just had about the fire plan, I think absolutely needs to be a one. I think just to continue the discussion about valuation increases and how that does or does not affect property tax statements, and just so people understand that a little bit more, and then how uh, the, the strategic plan is affected by, or how it affects budgets just in general. And um, I think that's that's a worthwhile, uh, those three things are pretty meaty, and I think that will take up more than enough table space for you if you, you answered those questions. And then you also asked the question, what questions do we want to learn through this process? And it's probably too broad, and it isn't necessarily budget specific, but just to talk to people and say, where do you get your information and how would you like to get your information? How would be the best way? We've got a lot of good detail, a lot of information about what we're doing, how we do it, where the money goes, where the money comes from, all those different pieces. How do we get that information into people's hands so they, they can learn it and they can understand it? And I think that's, I would be curious to hear what people have to say about it. And I think a lot of people, I, I, don't, I honestly don't know what they would say in terms of the best way to do that, the best way to communicate with folks. So those would be my three suggestions in terms of what to, uh, what to plan for and uh, at least one question that we could ask the community. Councilmember Coulter and then Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor. Um, actually, pretty similar, pretty similar answers to these questions. I would add, um, at the risk of giving you way too much information to share at you know, one table at the police department open house, um, I, I would add in terms of information to share, I don't think we can say enough times how it is exactly that people come to get the property tax bill that they get from the city. You know, what, what happens between when we set that final levy number at, you know, our 
second to last or last meeting in December between between that and when they get their property tax bill how do those numbers trans how does the first number translate to the second number because I think um, that that's a piece of information that that a lot of folks just need to hear over and over and over again um, as far as what information would we like to hear oh and actually sorry before uh, I move on the other piece that I think it would be helpful you know the the major I, well I guess I can't say majority but a large portion of every department's budget is personnel it's people it's salary and benefits right and I think it would be helpful <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. It would be helpful to share. I mean, we don't need to have like the complete pay schedule out there, right? But it would be, I think it would be helpful for folks to know, okay, if this is a big chunk of each department's budget, who who are the people that are are making up that chunk, if that makes sense, right? Like, I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest that perhaps the largest portion of uh, the police department budget, as an example, is you know, off officers who walk the beat for lack of a better phrase. Right. And so, you know, what does, what does that look like for public works and legal and all of that? Who are, you know, what are the specific positions that make up that chunk uh, that is personnel? Um, and then to the second question, I think it would be really interesting and, and helpful for us to know in a similar vein to, to what the mayor suggested, what is sort of, <coughs> excuse me, understanding that this is not going to be a, a, a scientific survey, that it's going to be pretty self-selected. What is the perception as far as, you know, how the, how the city spends its money? What, you know, what, what do people, what percentage, if you want to do it this way, you know, what percentage do people think the police department makes up and, and public works and, and fire and all of that versus the reality? Um, because I, I think that to me would be really interesting as far as um, how we would how we communicate and what we communicate in terms of, of where folks think our priorities are versus, versus uh, where they are. Councilmember Martin and Councilmember Carter. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you for this, uh, Kari, and the robust engagement coming up on the schedule here. Uh, kind of to tag on to the point the mayor raised about uh, prioritization, uh, just kind of off the back of the envelope, we've got a lot of big plans coming up here. Parks master plan, our public safety infrastructure improvements, alternative transportation plan needs an update. We've already talked about trail system investments and where we're going to go with that. Neighborhood commercial node renewal. Obviously, we've got a lot of big things coming up. And it, it is valuable to know what folks prioritize. But I, I'd be curious, and not in an intensive way, to figure out prioritize over what. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, you're excited about investing in the park system, but what... What's less exciting to you? Obviously, it's all critical and important, uh, but just to know that a lot of folks are excited about each one doesn't help me figure out what I tackle in what order and to what degree. Uh, so if there's a way to have people be able to rank, this is what I would want to see first, second, third, knowing it's it's all going to get done. Um, and perhaps that's something that's a little bit easier to do on something like a Let's Talk page. So even if we could have a QR code or a handout that could direct people afterwards to go do that, um, but that would help me to synthesize that information and turn it into what are we doing for 2023. Thank you. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. So as I looked at the questions from last year, I actually really liked them, but I just think they need to be, I would reword them a little bit. So I would love to know just like what do people love most about living in Bloomington and hear the responses to that. And then I do agree around the prioritization. And so, um, I was imagining in person, but obviously we'd want to have an online component as well. But even just having kind of one of those dot exercises, right, where people get three dots, red, yellow, green, and they get to rank kind of their favorite city or, or what they think are the most important city services or amenities. And then, uh, and then I think we even have the opportunity to kind of structure that a little bit more, where if, whether it's parks or fire department or – um, you know, the range of other needs we have and have people rank those. And so do agree with what Councilmember Martin was saying. And I think that I, I'm not an expert in online facilitation, but I feel like there are a lot of creative ways to do that in person. And I assume you 
have expertise <coughs> in that car or the co-ed division would have that too. And then I also just have some other recommendations on kind of how we're doing the engagement. And so uh, I assume that you're going to have the website like you had last year. I know I found that incredibly helpful to refer people to when they had questions. And I just thought you did an excellent job. And then I would recommend that we increase engagement. Um, we've talked about town halls. So when those get planned, I think it would make a lot of sense to even just have a table at the town halls where people can come learn about the upcoming um, uh, budget discussions and decisions that are going to be made. And then even thinking a little bit more around, um, I mean, I think you've done a great job of meeting people where they're at, like with the um, events at the band shell, but even thinking about how we can partner with others, like maybe we could have a session at the brewery or some other um local venue where a lot of people like to hang out. And then uh, lastly, I would just ask that maybe there be some planning um, done around engaging small businesses, local businesses in these discussions. I know that when I had my meeting with uh, the Drool and Moose uh, owners, they had lots of questions around property taxes and the local option sales tax. And so even if it was kind of a bit of, bit of a broader conversation around kind of the local uh, tax environment, uh, I think that more information there would be better just so that, I mean, if, when there is a, when there isn't as much information going to a certain sector, then they can kind of fill in, right, mm -hmm. uh, with what is circulating in the community. And so I just think if we can get ahead of that, that would be great. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Good suggestions. Thank you. Councilmember D'Alessandro. I think they're great. And uh, I had one very similar to what Councilmember Martin suggested, so I think that just double down on endorsing that. Um, the only thing that I would add is that I, you know, I know, Car, you're one person, and um, we're asking a lot of you. I, I would, I would certainly recommend and um, encourage uh, our department heads to also make themselves available in these moments, um, especially since we do kind of as we review the budget throughout the year, we go somewhat by department by department and project by project and things like that, and so you know, concurrent with when those are coming up on council meetings or whatever, to have one of those department heads along with you um, at, at the, at the I don't know, you know, the next time you're meeting or whatever, I think that might be really uh, beneficial um, so that people can get more in-depth questions about, about where the money goes today, what the proposals are and why they're, why they're considering increases or decreases or other things like that. Um, and um, so that I would just, you know, tag team or, get some help uh, so you're not the only person that's uh, we're going to ask you to go to everything possible under the sun here in the next <laughs> six months trying to get this over the line. Uh, but um, I think, you know, since they're involved in the projects anyway and, and in the proposal and the building of the budget anyway, um, they'd be a great resource, and I think people would love to see them too. Thanks. Thanks. Councilmember Lohman. Thank you, Mary. I think, I think the, my, my colleagues have, have raised some excellent uh, items. One, one item that doesn't really fit into these two questions here is I, I'm just curious about how inflation is going to impact our budget. Uh, what, what's the impact going to be, you know, uh, overall? And so I'd be, be curious to look at that. And I know that's not what we're kind of talking about tonight. But as we continue this conversation about the budget, I'd like to whatever we can dig into that to just kind of understand what type of impact that's going to have when we get to the that piece. And then I'll, I'll second the idea for the town halls. Uh, I think that they need to be a part of this uh, calendar, but I know we're not, probably not there yet in terms of organizing that, but uh, I'd be interested in us having that conversation. I know that um, the last time we had this conversation, we uh, the town halls, we had the opportunity to kind of have conversations about some of that deferred maintenance around the buildings. And I think that really did help folks to understand that. So then to answer specifically uh, the questions that you've kind of <laughs> raised here, um, I'll start with the bottom one first. One information uh, that I would like to know as a council member to gather from the public, you know, we look at the demographics of our city and, you know, we've really got, you know, a lot of different folks. We've got the seniors who are kind of getting older. Um, and we have a number of new families that are kind of coming in. We've got these different breakdowns uh, of different incomes across the city, 
uh, shifting demographics from a cultural perspective. And one of the things that would be helpful for me is I really want to understand uh, what the impact is. You know, we have this uh, pandemic. Um, how, how are they doing now? How, how are you doing now from, you know, from an income standpoint, uh, uh, you know, what, what you're paying? Uh, and I'm not sure how you do this, but that's why you guys are so brilliant. So I'll throw it to you. But, you know, how do, you, how do we figure out how our, our residents are, are kind of dealing with the impacts of the, of the pandemic and also uh, of their situation in terms of income? What are the challenges that they're, they're kind of facing? Because I think just for me as a council member, you know, as I go door to door, uh, some of those different demographics and different people, they, they kind of say, hey, you know, this is really impacting me in terms of how, how I'm going to deal with this. And so I'd like to have a, a more, uh, a better cross-section of the, of the public uh, to try to have a look at that. And then um, uh, we have put forth a new uh, mission statement here and different strategies and I, I'd be curious to see uh, what folks think of those ideas. And in terms of now that we're shifting with these strategies and a new mission, what's one thing that, you know, you'd like to see in the budget? You know, and maybe one thing you, you maybe would like to see us kind of move away from um, uh, uh, to the point that uh, you raised uh, earlier. And then the last thing, I think the mayor has brought this forward, and I think uh, Councilmember Nelson also brought forward. I'd really like to see us uh, take a temperature of that fire piece to kind of see – uh, if we were to increase that, uh, uh, increase that that levy, how far are you willing to go? Um, would you would you, you know, have six, uh, twelve, you know, twenty four people? Um, how much of a levy increase would you uh, uh, be willing to stomach uh, um, if we were to bring that forward? And then, given the demographics question, you know, if we could break it down that way, so. Maybe you don't do all of those, but it, it, maybe one of those uh, is possible to do, but I'd be interested in, in any of those if you're able to do it. Thank you. Car's going to be busy on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Anyone else? Any other suggestions? Very good. I think you've got plenty to work on or work with there. So appreciate the, uh, the presentation. Uh, appreciate the the uh, discussion also and this asking for the suggestions. Mr. Verbrugge, anything to add here, Jamie? A little slow on the switch, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the questions that everybody has asked and um, I, I uh, share Council Member Lohman's concerns about the inflationary impacts. Uh, what Kari is talking about today is largely focused on our revenue projections and uh, we have a, a decent grasp on where we're going to be on expenditures for 2023 because uh, uh, to an earlier question about, I think it was Council Member Coulter, about where, uh, what types of services or what types of costs are in within each of those departments. Uh, in organization-wide, uh, people are about 70 to 72% of our um, total operating expense. And so, uh, as we think about inflationary impact, we have a good grasp on what the um, what the uh, labor costs are going to be. Uh, it's that remaining 28 to 30 percent that we get a little bit nervous about because that's our materials and supplies. And so we're going to be keeping a close eye on that. We'll see what the departments submit here over the next couple months as they start to put their depart their uh, their budgets together. Um, you know, we're obviously seeing uh, some impact already just in uh, pricing for uh, projects as we go out and council's familiar with that. We'll have a much better sense on the rest of it here uh, relatively soon. So uh, good questions that you proposed. Uh, we're looking forward to getting out there and talking to folks about it and we'll certainly bring back more information when we have it. Very good, thank you. Else any questions for Mr. Verbrugge on that? Very good. Kari, thank you. Thanks for your flexibility. Thanks for popping in from India. Appreciate it and appreciate your, your work on all of this and look forward to seeing you on Saturday at the open house. Thank you. All right. Night. Have a good night. We'll finish up our agenda tonight with item 5.2, our city council policy and issue update. Uh, I will kick it off just as a, for a recap of our uh, council listening session that we held before the council meeting. Heard from three people again this evening. Uh, Sally Ness talked to us again uh, specifically about a conditional use permit from uh, back in the 
uh, I think 2011 time frame or 2010 time frame, and asking specifics about the uh, the legality and the signatures and so on, some pretty specific kind of things, and we were working back and forth, and I think we'll try and get to uh, more details on that as we have them in front of us, either the uh, the minutes from those meetings or the specifics on some of the agreements that she's talking about. Uh, we did talk uh, specifically trying to figure out uh, exactly where, what we were trying to accomplish with these discussions and, and uh, Sally brought forward that she she believed there were some issues when some of these conditional use permits were approved back in 2011 and she wants to make sure that uh, the council and the city learn from those past mistakes and that we as we move forward we don't do that again I think that was uh, what I heard is her her uh, main uh, goal in this that she wants to move this forward and make sure that there are, there aren't issues uh, moving forward uh, we heard from Phil Coton, who is uh, on our planning commission. Uh, he wasn't speaking to us as a planning commissioner. He was speaking to us as a rider of the Metro Blue Line. And he expressed some significant concerns about how the quality of the service on the Blue Line has gone down. And I'm not saying how quickly it gets to the stations, but rather the, uh, the, the uh, folks on the Blue Line and how it's being used and patrolled. He had concerns about smoking in the cars and trash and trash at the stations and illicit drug use, illegal drug use on the, on the trains, uh, and just an overall feeling of unease, I think, and unsafety on the, on the trains. We did talk about some specific steps that we could use to address those concerns. We, I suggested that we could uh, contact or, or write a letter of concern to our Metro Cou Met Council representative, Molly Cummings, who uh, former mayor of Hopkins, and to express those concerns and, again, ask what specific steps the Met Council could be taking. We also heard from Chief, uh, Chief Hodges that uh, they were uh, planning to and have done in the past to uh, station Bloomington police officers on the trains but to, in the Bloomington stations so basically from mall of america up to 34th not going into minneapolis and then turning around and coming back in just offering another opportunity to have a uniform presence on this on the trains and to make it uh to provide a bit more feeling of safety for the the passengers so i think there's there's definitely we all agree there's work to be done on that and we will definitely look into it and uh, do what we can and we will um we'll report back as we hear more uh from from our counterparts on the met council and then Natalie Morose came forward and she had a specific question. Uh, who is the correct person to contact if a property tax exemption is incorrectly filed? And um, Mr. Sable brought some <coughs> good suggestions for the folks at the county because the property taxes obviously would be a county issue. Uh, we also suggested, I'm sure Matt Gershmull, our, our city assessor, could probably offer some suggestions as well. I haven't suggested from a customer service standpoint contacting Debbie Gattel, our county commissioner, who probably has plenty of ideas about who would be best to address those questions. And so those were the three questions we had, and those uh, are the folks that we talked to this evening at our listening session. I just have one more thing to add this evening, is the uh, Bloomington Police Department open house this Saturday, the 21st. It's going from 11, to 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. right here at Civic Plaza. Uh, I have an opportunity to tour the police station. You'll be able to, to look at some of the great apparatus that they have, uh, talk with folks in the, uh, uh, the SWAT team or the bomb squad or the canine unit. Everybody loves the dogs. The dogs are the greatest. And uh, so please do join us. It's rain or shine Saturday morning. Good opportunity to get a look inside the police department. A very good opportunity to meet our new police chief, Booker T. Hodges. He has said he will take uh, selfies with people as long as they are there. So he's got that to look forward to. And... Uh, <laughs> We're looking forward to a good time uh, at the uh, the open house on Saturday, and we really hope you'll join us there. So, Council, uh, we'll get to you in just a second. Mr. Sable. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I just wanted to provide a brief update on the Earn Sick and Safe Leave uh, outreach that we have done. I want to extend the appreciation and thanks to the Mall of America staff for hosting three sessions with us, one with uh, uh, tenants, a direct tenant meeting where the city staff and uh, Council Member Nelson were able to be present and talk about uh, this issue specifically as part of a, a, a forum, and then they also offered up uh, direct space to do one-on-one -on -one Q and A's, and so I actually got to meet the folks from Drool and Moose and a few other uh, rest, uh, local uh, establishments in Bloomington. Really good, robust dialogue. I mean, there, there was one person who stayed for about 90 minutes or so. Just really specific questions on outreach, and then I also want to uh, acknowledge that 
we are uh, doing some engagement with uh, a local group that has a connection to about 2,000 actual employees of color in the community. And so we are going to do some direct outreach, not only about what the uh, ordinance would do, but more importantly, that um, if it is passed, that they would know how to use it. And so really trying to develop some two-stage uh, engagement. So I really want to do two things. Number one, tell you that the outreach is working. Number two, extend an appreciation and thanks to the mall staff for being good hosts. Thank you, Mr. Sable. Any questions about that from Mr. Sable? No? Mr. Verbrugge, you turn your camera on. Did you want to chime in here? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, we do have a uh, fuller uh, rundown on the legislative session scheduled for the council meeting next Monday night. Um, but as council is aware, they're, <clears throat> they're in the final throes here of trying to work things out. And uh, there was an announcement uh, earlier today that uh, there seems to be a global agreement between the House and the Senate and the governor's office. Uh, so hopefully they will be able to uh, come to terms shortly. And that's important because uh, one of the issues that we have uh, is the request for the local option sales tax. And as council is aware, we are in both of the um, tax bills. The Senate tax bill has the full request. The uh, House tax bill modified the request uh, so that three of the four projects are in the House bill. Uh, and uh, hopefully that'll get worked out in conference committee. So we are cautiously optimistic uh, that uh, if a tax bill is indeed agreed upon here in the next few days, that we'll have uh, some uh, clarity about where the Bloomington request sits. So look forward to uh, next Monday night getting the full report on that at the end of session. Thank you, Mr. Verbrugge. Questions of Mr. Verbrugge? Council, anything to add tonight? Councilmember Lowman. I was just going to uh, <clears throat> mention a couple of things. One, I wanted to thank uh, uh, Councilmember Coulter for bringing forward the uh, the council pay uh, piece. I know you've been a uh, leader on that and trying to champion that. And I certainly appreciate you mentioning that, and I hope that we will uh, find a way to, to get it out of this, this body's uh, hands because it does seem like a uh, conflict of interest. So I, I, I appreciate your, your statements earlier um, about that. And then the, the secondary thing I wanted to mention um, – uh, it was that we did have our, our uh, Diamond Service Awards uh, over the weekend, and um, <clears throat> a number of us council members were able uh, uh, to attend, and I, I, I realized we knew, now have a new sheriff in town, <laughs> and that's our mayor uh, here, and he did a fantastic job of uh, focusing in on uh, food safety and uh, how important that is, um, and remembering and reminding us how important that is, and uh, that's the heart of the uh, awards, and then just a number of folks uh, showing up uh, for the first time in a number of years, uh, uh, certainly highlighting the uh, hospitality industry that we have here uh, in the city of Bloomington and how important that is. I'm not sure, Mayor, if you want to say anything else? Or no, uh, thank you for bringing that up, Council Member. I, I would say, just say hats off, first of all, to the Bloomington Convention and Visitors Bureau. They they. They are the only convention and visitors bureau in the country that does this type of award ceremony, and it's just fantastic. Uh, hats off to all the city staff that was there. I think it, it shows the support that the city has for the hospitality industry. And more than anything, hats off to the hospitality workers in the city of Bloomington. Uh, they are just the absolute foundation and bedrock of Bloomington's reputation as a, as a friendly uh, destination, world-class destination for people. Uh, without those folks, it just would not happen, and they just do outstanding work. And so it's always a great event, and it was great to get back together again. Yeah. Councilmember D'Alessandro. I wanted to propose um, something that we don't necessarily have to follow up on right now, but um, uh, because I don't know the answer to this, but I've been getting a couple of, of questions from constituents in my area around um, – Deer mitigation, and I think we met, talked about this a little bit um, before. Um, I just don't know. I don't know what to tell people is what our policy is, or um, who they should call because it's not us, or you know whatever. So if if we could um, if we could get some material together so that uh, we can all be a little bit more educated. I mean, it's a good problem to have in in one way, in the sense that we have a a, a thriving you know natural area, right? But it's also usually indicative of an imbalance in our 
predator prey uh, function. People like to talk about coyotes, but nobody really wants them in their backyard, but they do have a purpose. Um, so anyway, if we could, if we could just get some understanding about that so that uh, if anybody else, I don't know if anybody else is hearing about it, but I, you know, given that Tierney's woods and all that area is in my patch, I hear about it a lot. So I would love to get some help with that. Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members, council member Del Alessandro. Uh, we, um, we used to have about five or six thousand dollars in our budget uh, for uh, deer mitigation, and what that money uh, typically went for was uh, paying for a census a deer count, uh, and then I believe there was a little bit, uh, not so much that went to an outside group that helped with the uh, thinning of the herd, as it were. Um, so I'd have to I have to go back in the files and get the details on it. But the last time we did that was about four or five years ago, um, and and we just we we had a number of items that we were reducing budgets on back in 2017 or so 2018. Um, and you're right, it's uh, it's one of those things that ebbs and flows. So uh, typically, what happens is the uh, deer uh, census is done over the winter because it's a lot easier to count them without leaves on the trees and you have a typically a white background so uh, a, a lot of times it's an aerial survey and then uh, often there'll be a an agreement with a like a bow hunters organization or some other group that will come in and and will coordinate uh, the the thinning so we'll uh, we'll do a little bit of uh, research on on where that stands and uh, when we get into the budget process we'll bring that back as an item for council to consider sure i appreciate that and and you know there's also the just the function of um you know there are things you can do as a homeowner that uh help deter deer as well and so i don't know if there's a need at this point if this is just going to be one year's problem bumper crop if you will uh versus it's an ongoing thing we might want to be more comprehensive in our approach especially to the folks who might be um, sensitive or vulnerable to, you know, our furry friends. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Council, anything else? I see no hands going up. Council, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Loman, second by Councilmember Martin to adjourn tonight's meeting. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you for your work tonight. Thanks to staff. Good job, everybody. Have a good evening.